Good morning, everybody. Uh, I looked at the program and saw that I have allotted the time of five minutes, which I thought I had to fill. So I will inflict some of my views on you very quickly. Now, I was very interested by the talks yesterday and especially by the first talk we had yesterday morning because it reminded me of something that we tend to forget, which is what I would call the non-homogeneity of experience. That means that there is a gap between our knowledge system and what really happens in the world. And we don't see that gap because we are all ensconced within language, within the language of mathematics, within everything else. So we tend to forget that the mathematical formulation of an explosion and the actual explosion are still two different things because the mathematical formulation is a der derivative of our ability to speak. Now, why is that important? It's important for the way we uh, construct the world in the following sense, which is a tool. And it's obvious to anybody who heard yesterday's talk that tools are the basis for our linguistic ability. The point about a tool is that the parts of the tool are not like the whole tool and you have to look at the parts and you have to understand that if you put the tool together, you are taking things that do not, in fact, cohere in the sense of being a homunculus, a little man in a, in a, in a little thing, but actually are non-homogeneous with the whole of the tool. And once you learn that, you can then move to language. Why? Because in language too, the words chair is not the chair. If I say kise, that's in a different language, that's also not the chair and so on and so forth. That's, I think, a very important point because we who have constructed an abstract system to think about the world through words and through numbers tend to forget that the abstract system is not the reality itself. There's non-homogeneity of experience. That's all I have to say about this. Now, the other thing is that I want to uh, tell you how proud I am to uh, chair this morning's session, and especially because of one talk, and that's Leo Corey's talk, who's going to talk about the math departments at the Weizmann Institute and at the Hebrew University. And the reason is that my father was a member of the math department of the Hebrew University during those years, and he was the president of what became the Israel Mathematical Society. And so when I hear a talk about mathematics in the 1930s and the 1940s without understanding a word of mathematics or a formula of mathematics, it sort of comes back to be a familiar experience. This kind of knowledge by acquaintance is something that many of you have with the different scientific talks. Now that's my five minutes, I think I got in under. So now let me present this morning's session. And I don't have, do we have a thing that we produce? This? Does, is the system there tell me who everybody is and what they did? No, all right. So I will, so as I don't know it, I will spare you all the achievements of all the people that, that we are, have this morning. And I just hope that you will figure them out because they're all quite a list of people and I've known many of them for several years. So our first talk is by Wolfgang Lefebvre who has an illustrious career be, uh, behind him and in front of him, we hope. And he is going to address us on the subject of science and the Industrial Revolution. Wolfgang, please. Of course. Just by by this. Okay. Lieber Jürgen, dear colleagues and dear friends, the topic <clears throat> science and the industrial. Yeah, 
Okay, I have to see. The topic science <clears throat> and the industrial revolution has been much discussed in recent years. In this short talk, I just want to address a few aspects of the topic <clears throat> that are of interest to the history of science and which I think had not been sufficiently discussed so far. <clears throat> it's not that easy. <clears throat> uh, given uh, the time available, I can only do this very pointedly and often simply present thesis. Let's start by stating, neither did science generate or induce the industrial revolution, nor did the industrial revolution generate or induce science that were applicable in material production. This statement, although undisputed among historians, contains a problem or more precisely a bundle of problems from the point of view of the history of science. Problems that concerns the topic of this session, namely the topic modes of evolution of knowledge. The industrial revolution could not have been taken place <clears throat> and the industrial mode of production could not have been sustained and expanded if some sciences had not developed before the industrial revolution in such a way that they could be used as resources of material production or transformed into such that the industrial revolution or more generally the industrial mode of production generated the conditions for their deployment. Why and how had some sciences developed in this way in the early modern period? What was the mode of the development of those sciences that could be transformed in resources of material production by and in the wake of the Industrial Revolution? Is there something about in, in this mode of development that was decisive for bringing forth sciences that could be transformed in this way? And how can we establish something about it? A systematic investigation of the relationship between scientific and technological literature of the early modern period is one suitable way to uncover characteristics and perhaps surprising features of the development of sciences that were later transformed into resources of production. Having recently undertaken such an investigation, I would like to present some results briefly and exemplarily for the fields of mechanics and chemistry. First, mechanics. Perhaps the most remarkable feature <coughs> about the, <coughs> sorry. Perhaps the most remarkable feature about the relationship between theoretical and practical mechanics and is, is that both in the early modern period developed largely independently of each other with only very few mutual impulses between the two. First, the, the medieval science of mechanics, if there were, was any, largely ignored the practical mechanics of their age. In turn, medieval practical mechanicians the engineers, as we want to call them anachronistically in this talk, did not take notice of the Latin manuscripts on mechanical issues circulating in the distinguished sphere of the universities. However, these engineers were familiar with the so-called mechanical powers, that is lever, wheel and axle, pulley, inclined plane, wedge and screw, in whatever way of transmission they had become acquainted with this results, not necessarily with the theory of ancient statics. Second, the revival of studies. 
the revival of studies in theoretical mechanics in the second half. No, let me finish on this. Okay. Second half of the 16th century, to name just Federico Comandino, Giuseppe Ceredi, Guidobaldo del Monte, and so on, was due not to questions and problems posed by his contemporary technological literature on mechanical engineering, but to the rediscovery of classical texts such as Archimedes, Heron of Alexandria, and the pseudo Aristotelian Questiones Mechanicae. These studies found some resonance among me mechanical engineers, particularly Ciaredi, Simon Stevin, and others, but proved to be of little help, particularly because they initially excluded dynamical issues. It must be emphasized, however, that gunnery was an important impious on the part of the practice from which revisions and further developments of traditional dynamics emanated. However, the further elaboration of this theory in the 17th century, which developed nothing less than the basic concepts of modern Newtonian dynamics, momentum, force, inertia, etc., owed almost nothing to the rich and impressive developments of contemporary mechanical engineering and vice versa. Thus, the 17th century elaborations of basic concepts of modern Newtonian mechanics cannot be taken as resulting from reflections on the procedures, tools, or the insights and open questions of contemporary engineers or gunners. Rather, these elaborations were bound to follow a particular style of reasoning they inherited from the ancient models the style of deductive Euclidean reasoning by mathematical means. The prevailing fruitlessness of the inter interrelations and interactions between learned and practical mechanics that can be stated on the whole for the early modern period owed much to exactly this style of reasoning on the side of learned mechanics. Deductive reasoning implied not only certain methodological constraints, but also imposed an idealization of the subjects of inquiry. Physical objects such as levers or projectiles then became geometrical lines or points. Idealization proved to be a serious obstacle for interactions between scientific and practical mechanics. It was a major reason why practical mechanics was unable to benefit from scientific mechanics for a long period. What is more, the science of mechanics failed when confronted with urgent practical problems such as friction, recoil, or aerodynamic drag. On the other hand, <clears throat> There was a latent or at times even open conflict between the deductive style of reasoning and the orientation of the incipient modern science of mechanics, which is was empirical in principle. The solution of this conflict required special forms of access to the experiential world, namely access mediated by experiments, particularly those experiments that procured exact measurements as an operational basis for mathematical reasoning. It was exactly this constellation in which the achievements of practical mechanics became a resource of scientific mechanics, namely in relation to the latter's experimental work. Eventually, in the 18th century, the, the new science of mechanics, along with a new tool of mathematical analysis, made it possible to tackle some of the urgent problems of mechanical engineering, measurement of the driving forces of machines, calculation of friction, finding optimal, sh optimal shapes for ma machine parts like cogs, and so on. This advanced science not only met up with competent 
mechanical engineers, but also with an advanced technology that allowed to appropriate and translate useful scientific, scientific results. As a result, a new and close relationship between technological and scientific literature and mechanics arose and continued developing. In summary, one can say on largely independent paths of development, both learned and practical mechanics brought about the conditions with which together in their interaction made mechanics a resource of material production. Now to chemistry. First, the learned counterpart of early modern chemical practices was not a unified body of chemical theories, but a few diverse natural philosophical theories of the ultimate constitution of matter. In Aristotle, Aristotelian one, a Neoplatonic, a Stoic theory, besides several atomistic theories. The reception of this heritage by early modern chemists cannot be called anything but eclectic. Second, as regards to specific chemical issues, no learned or theoretical literature existed separately from the te technological literature before the 17th century. Before the 18th century, technological and natural philosophical writings are mostly indistingu indistinguishable in the field of chemistry. Third, the relationship between natural philosophical assumptions <clears throat> and chemical practices was one of associations and analogies. The two sides did not build upon one another. Rather, these two sides were largely autonomous, even though the theoretical and practical explanations could be linked with each other. And by the categories and key assumptions of these philosophical theories of matter owed nothing to developments of chemical procedures or the expansion of the multitude of sub substances they possess. Conversely, these technical, technological developments owed nothing at all to these theories. Of course, around 1700, a new type of theory began to emerge. It was not another philosophical matter theory yet again, but a chemical theory in the modern sense of the term, that is a theory of the laws that rule the behavior and interactions of chemical substances. This theory resulted from reflections of metallurgical processes and above all of new procedures of salt, salt production. Reflections based on the rich technological literature on these processes and procedures. Thus, from the 17th century, two diff different relationships existed between learned and practical knowledge in the field of early modern chemistry. First, up to the 17th century, the relationship between practical knowledge and natural philosophical theories of matter and second, from the mid 17th century on, the relationship between practical knowledge and an emerging theory of certain interactions of chemical substances. As Osla Klein has shown, what eventually prompted a new theory of chemical processes was indeed certain technical developments, or more precisely, irritating occurrences brought about by these developments or challenging objects such as the reversibility of certain chemical processes, the preservation of substances in dissolutions, and so on. However, it was not interpretations of these technical developments in terms of ultimate forces as proposed by one of the philosophical matter theories that led to this new chemical theory, but reflections focused on intermediate and experimentally accessible forces. In its beginnings, this new theory 
profited less from experiments than from systematic analysis and evaluations <clears throat> of relevant technologies as decried in the rich technological chemical literature, literature of the 17th century. The close relationship between technological and scientific literatures is rarely as clear as in this case, where a scientific theory evolved through, through studying and conceptualizing natural laws as utilized in technological processes and documented in technical manuals. Some conclusions. The fact <clears throat> is that the incipient science of mechanics developed until the 18th century largely without significant exchange with practical mechanics was ultimately due to a profound but often overlooked ambivalence regarding the theor theoretical constitution of the science in the early stage of its development. It started as a deductive Euclidean style enterprise with vague or at least barely substantiated claims to empirical validity. No wonder the practical mechanics could not utilize such theorems or enlist the support of the science of mechanics in overcoming its bottlenecks. And conversely, this early modern science of mechanics found little more in contemporary practical mechanics than thought provoking problems with no starting point for promising conceptualizations. Thus, before the 18th century, theoretical and practical mechanics developed largely along separate paths. However, each of them on its own path generated achievements that eventually proved to be prerequisite conditions for productive relations in which each could profit from the de developments of the other. On the theoretical me me mechanics side, it was particularly new power for mathematical methods, above all mathematical analysis, that made it possible to tackle intricate empirical problems like friction, aerodynamical strike, like, or recoil. And on the practical me mechanics side, it was standardized mechanical devices and precision instruments that facilitated the use of theoretical mechanics for practical purposes and opened up access to the empirical world for the science by means of experiments. The letter enabled the science of mechanics to become a real empirical theory, a real empirical theory that could be transformed into a resource of production. In the case of the incipient science of chemistry, we encountered a completely different path of development. The unity of practical knowledge and the theoretical reflections in the framework of traditional natural philosophical theories of the ultimate constitution of matter was an apparent unity only. There was no real interaction between the two sides. A chemical theory in today's meaning of the term that is a theory based on knowledge of the laws that rule the interactions of chemical substances emerged in the decades around 1700 through, a, through comparative analysis and reflections of certain chemical operations. This science started as an empirical one, by induction rather than deduction, to put it in terms of philosophy of science. The development of the incipient science of mechanics is often taken as a paradigmatic for, for, for the genesis of modern sciences. Considering the variety of ways in which the modern physical sciences developed in the early modern period, it appears highly questionable for an historian, of, for an historian to privilege one of these ways as epitomizing the scientific revolution. Only an integrated view or synopsis of this variety can do justice to both the richness and the contingencies of these developments. As regards the de development path of the series of, in the field of mechanics and chemistry considered here, it is suggestive to take up Kuhn's distinction between two main types of early modern natural sciences, namely 
the distinction between classical or mathematical sciences, that is astronomy, mechanics, optics, on the one side, and Econium or exp experimental sciences, chemistry, electricity, heat, magnetism, on the other. The former type, also the classical, has its indeed classical model in Archimedes' theory of statics. It is in a mathematical theory of a tool, the lever. As regards the second type, the chemical theory that arose around 1700 can claim to epitomize Bacon's experimental history, Historia Experimentalis, that is to be an investigation of production processes. It is important to keep this in mind when it comes to understanding how some early modern sciences developed in such a way that they became sciences that could be transformed in resources of material production by and in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, what we've decided to do is take a few quick questions now, and if there's time, we will return in the discussion. Does anybody have a question right now? Yes. Yeah, thank you for this very interesting thesis. It seems to me that there is another science, namely optics, where the story might be a little different. First, we had the interaction of painters with optical theories in order to develop a theory of perspectives. And later on, optics was much concerned with practical problems, namely refractions of optimal optical rays in, 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 in lenses, and also the diffraction of, at, at, at the boundaries between different media, which gave important inspiration for the series of Snellius, Descartes, Fermat, and, and, and all those other people. Would you then think that in that field there was a closer interaction between practical problems and theoretical considerations than in the fields of mechanics and chemistry that you have analyzed? No, I think, you know, uh, up to the, yeah, up to the time of Newton and even up to the time of uh, the 18th century, there was a big gap between geometrical optics and physical optics. And both did not so easily match up with one another. And this had, of course, uh, consequences for the practical uh, um, understand for, for practical issues in, in this telescopes, the barrels, and so on and so on. As the, the problem was, I think, similar. Uh, but we can discuss it more. Jurgen? Yeah, thank you, Wolfgang, for this very clear outline, uh, with, which gives us sort of a larger historical understanding for how the scientific and the industrial revolutions might be connected. And I fully agree with the picture, but I have two questions. One is, and, and I think they are not in contrast to what you said, but I, it's maybe a, a matter of emphasis. Isn't it the case that uh, you mentioned the problem of gunnery? I think yourself have worked on the problem of the pendulum, that the choice of certain problems like ballistics or like the pendulum was a connection point between the practical and the theoretical that somehow, you know, acted like a priority list, what is important and what is purely academic, so to say. Uh, and the second question is, how do you deal in this framework, which is sort of clearly distinguishing between different lines of devolution, uh, with the fact that some people like Galileo, as we know from Matteo's work in particular, have a personal identity of practical and, uh, and theoretical mechanisms. And I think to some extent that's true yeah. for many others as well, perhaps even for Guidobaldo del Monte. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's the first point. 
I think it's uh, not really doing it. I, I, I said so. Mm. That's, uh, sorry, that uh, definitely was one of the points where it came an impulse from the practical side into the, uh, but at the same time, as a Tatalia, so at the same time, the uh, learned machination like he did while they want to, in the first in the first place refused to have a science of dynamics okay and uh, the impulse uh, uh, started a development Galileo and so on in the dynamics and the path from Galileo to has nothing to do with the practical economy. You can see that at, at the problem of the tra trajectory. But the issue is simply wrong in practice. As if you really shoot, not with ink, but with the shots. So, yeah, of course, people will be Simon Stevin, Galileo, and so on. But you have to, uh, to see where is really their practical thing? Uh, decisive for the theoretical uh, developments that they make. I, I, I would say that even in this person is a, yeah, it's a, a gap between the two sides. But one more over here. Thank you. Uh, I would like to know your thoughts on the role played by engineers, mostly military engineers, military engineers, uh, precisely uh, in this uh, embodiment of practice and the theory, as their uh, training was precisely a mix of these two. So they had a, a more theoretical practical uh, training, but then they were, of course, uh, doing it on uh, the ground. And so I would like to know your thoughts on the training and also on the circulation of engineers all over Europe concerning uh, most uh, uh, of the main crowns in England, in, uh, in Europe at that time. Yeah. That's a short uh, uh, answer. If you look in, in, in the uh, manual for gunners of the 17th century, uh, sorry, if, if you look uh, in, into the manuals of, of gunners, in the, uh, you have a plethora of theories, how shots go. And almost every of them is wrong. This was the situation. This was the situation. There was some teaching, some literature, and so on, but no uh, solution which is was useful in practice. Okay, we're going to move on, given time constraints, to the next talk. Thank you. Wolfgang, for your illuminating talk. It gives me special pleasure to introduce Peter McLaughlin, because Peter McLaughlin, Rivka Feldhai, Jürgen Wren, and myself were all members of the same year at the Wissenschaftskolleg. That's how we know each other. Peter will address us on the subject of means and ends in the history of science. So Peter, the floor is yours. Um, uh, good morning. Um, uh, the clip doesn't work, so I can't run around. So I have to stay here and, and talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about means and ends in the history of science uh, and about internalism and externalism. Two key figures to their di diametrically opposed philosophical positions put their stamp on 20th century history of science. Both of them were Russians, born one year and 400 miles apart. At, towards the end of the 19th century. Uh, they were Boris Mikhailovich Gessen and Alexander Vladimirovich Koira. 
Alexandra Coiré and Boris Hessen represent opposite poles in the philosophical historiography of science, internalism and externalism. I say philosophical historiography uh, because historical historiography, or just call it the normal discipline of history, um, uh, knows nothing of externalism and externalism. Historians, at least contemporary historians, contextualize. That's what they do. That's sort of, so to speak, they're ergon, what they do, which makes them what they are. The quarrel between internalism and externalism is a philosophical issue injected into the discipline of history of science when philosophers hijacked the discipline in the 1930s. The institutionalization of history of science as a branch within history was interrupted by the externalist intervention of the Soviet delegation to a London conference. Um, and more importantly, by the subsequent internalist reaction to this intervention. Thus, when contemporary historians of science attempt to put the quarrel between internalism and externalism behind them, they are basically trying, okay. Mm -hmm. They are basically trying to return history of science to history, something that I, that I as a philosopher need not approve of. So uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is means and ends, history of science, internalism, externalism, and uh, the thesis that real internalism is externalist. Means and ends you all know about, I will be quick with that, history of science too, externalism and inter internalism nobody wants to talk about but me, and I will be brief on the fourth. So, well, let's see if this works. Okay, means and ends. Uh, if you only have a hammer, every problem looks like an eel. You've all heard some kind of joke like this. Um, there are all kinds of forms of this. It even has its own Wikipedia article, where as in Wikipedia articles, the joke is defanged and uh, made acceptable to everybody. Uh, I wanna keep the tension in the joke uh, in play. Instrumental rationality is something we all know. Someone acts rationally if she seeks appropriate means to give an ends. That's a standard notion of rationality. Everybody understands that. Um, the joke turns this around and says something, someone acts strangely if he seeks appropriate ends to give in means. Now, I want to convince you today uh, that this is not a bad idea. Um, that it also might be a form of rationality, the scientific form. Um, I'll start with some trivial observations. You can cut your hair with a scissors or a razor. That is, if you have an end, you can do it with different means. Or you can use a screwdriver to turn screws or to open a can of paint. We can generalize that. Purposes served by one tool, can often be served by others. The second one, tools invented for one purpose can often be used for other purposes. Further generalization, the same function can be performed by different structures. The same structure can perform different functions. This last generalization is almost tautology. Yeah? Um, if you, how do you define the relation of structure and function is basically this way. So I can generalize so far <laughs> that is more or less by definition, but let's stick with a lower level generalization tools. Okay, you can use a screwdriver to turn screws or open a can of paint. And you can use the rule for quantifying caritas to derive the law of fault. It's the same kind of thing. Um, so if you think about the relation of means and ends in science, I'm gonna make it short here. Um, what it means to have an end oh, can be very vague. If you wanna concretize 
what your end is, then you have to uh, take account of the means. I think given that we, I think we've, the, since our first ancestor saw a bird, we've always wanted to fly, yeah? Um, given we have a wish to fly, in order to make this wish a concrete goal of action, we have to take account of the means. I decided at some point, I am going to fly to Trieste. Uh, that's not just a wish. Um, it's a question of how do I get there? So what it means to want to fly is different according to what you could fly with. And here we have an example of Daedalus uh, who wanted to fly and made uh, wings of waxen feathers. It didn't work in the legend at least. The Montgolfier brothers wanted to fly and use a hot air balloon. The Wright brothers, uh, internal combustion engine. So what it means to want to do something, to have an end when it becomes concrete, depends very strongly on the means available to achieve that end. And so uh, as ends become concreter, they become more and more dependent on the means available. So much to, um, so that seeking ends that fit your means might just be a form of rationality. Um, and at the end, I'm gonna show you a quote from Thomas Kuhn. Uh, at one point, this is how he actually conceptualizes science as uh, um, fitting your ends to your means. History of science, what is history of science? I'm gonna make this brief because you all do this. I just remind you, or, or this is the way I look at it, there were things in the 19th century, uh, prehistory of science, but it began at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and it's interesting that Galileo, as an addition of projects, yeah, Gal you all know Galileo's uh, national edition, but Descartes' works are also a national edition under the auspices of the Ministry of Public Education. So history of science began as addition projects in the 20th century. Um, sponsored by the government. ISIS, uh, a journal was founded in 1913. Um, at the Cong International Conference was begun. Uh, the International Society of the History of Science as a branch of history was done in 1928. And their first meeting was held in Paris. And the second meeting, they opened themselves up to technology. So technology was in the title of the um, uh, second Congress, um, and they regretted it immediately because the Russians took it seriously. Um, and you all know the story of that, that conference, but that is the point where I say philosophy hijacked history of science. Um, Boris Hessen was the main, uh, um, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, robber <laughs> and um, uh, Alexandre Poiré, the main reaction to that. Um, and internalism in the philosophy, in the history of science was a reaction to um, this sort of thing. Um, the term internalism is normally uh, traced back to Robert Merton as, uh, who distinguishes between internalism and externalism. Specific discoveries and inventions belong to the internal history of science and are large, largely independent of factors other than the purely scientific. So a clear distinction. Um, but uh, Merton saw two ways in which society influences society, one encouraging the pursuit of science and by technology influencing the direction of science, what are, things are uh, interesting. But internalism pretty quickly moved into a discussion of the motives of science. Here's the, the, the first clear formulation against Hessen by uh, Dean Clark. In surveying the social background of the scientific movement, we have now distinguished five groups of influences, not just economics. Economic life, war, medicine, the arts, and religion. There still remains a motive which we have not considered the disinterested desire to know, the impulse of the mind to exercise itself methodologically and without any practical purpose is an independent and unique motive. So they are taking it, the internalists take it pretty quickly 
to a psychological level. Um, and of course, the motives that someone has to pursue science are completely external to science. Um, it's just a thought that if your motives are pure, that's different than if your motives are utilitarian. Um, but it's still just as external uh, as any other motivation if you look, at, look on it that way. Uh, Robert Merton's response was, Clark's recent critique of Hessen's essay may be taken to illustrate confusion, which derives from loose conceptualization concerning the relations between the motivation and the structural determinants of scientist behavior. Uh, externalism is interested in the structural determinants of science, not in the motivations of any particular scientist. So whether Robert Boyle was really religious or not is for the, and that was his motivation, is irrelevant for um, externalism. Um, this picks up on something that was in Wolfgang's talk. Um, uh, internalism even wasn't uh, psychological. Uh, had a peculiar idea about, about the relation of science and technology. Here's Poiré. For it is evident that in human history, it is technology that precedes science and not vice versa. Thus, since it is not from episteme that techne receives the rules that it follows and observes, since the rules do not fall from heaven, we have to admit an independent origin of technology. Thus, the existence of technological thought, practical thought, essentially different from the theoretical thought of science. Why does Coyre think that's important? Because if technology precedes science, it can't be the final cause of science. It can't be your motive for doing science. And therefore, because technology comes before science, it can't be relevant to explaining science. Uh, you, have, you have to think it through, wait a second. Something cannot be causally relevant for the explaining science because it comes before science. Because presupposition, it could only be the motivation of a scientist to do it. So that's our, our problem with externalism. Um, I didn't want to go into internalism uh, all on the basis of Poiré and the 20th century. Um, uh, there's a long history of, or let's put it this way. In the 20th century, we project archetypes. <laughs> we project our ideas on archetypes in, in Greece. And we have two um, good projection fields for this, uh, Herodotus and Aristotle. This is sort of the classical uh, externalist uh, view of science. Uh, where does geometry come from? The priests also say that it was this king who divided the land among all the Egyptians, giving to each man in allotment a square of equal size. From this, the king derived his revenues as he appointed the payment for this of a yearly tax. If the river should carry off a portion of the allotment, the man would come to the king himself and signify what had happened. Whereupon the king sent men to inspect and remeasure by how much the allotment had grown less, so that for the future it should be paid, he should pay proportionally less of the assigned tax. I think it was from this that geometry was discovered and came to Greece. Standard utilitarian view of science. Uh, they, uh, and of course, it can't be true. Um, I could just as well say um, he sent his men to Aswan to plant a dam so the river wouldn't overflow. And that's why we have hydrostatics. Um, just because you have needs doesn't mean you, you solve them. So that's not going to work in this interpretation, at least. But let's look at the competition. As Aristotle, if, uh, first uh, beginning of the metaphysics, as more and more arts were discovered, some relating to the necessities and some of the pastimes of life, the inventors of the latter were always considered wiser than those of the former, because their branches of knowledge did not aim at utility. Hence, when all the discoveries of this kind were fully developed, the sciences were with relate, which relate neither to pleasure nor yet to the necessities of life were invented, and first in those places where men had leisure. Thus, the mathematical sciences originated in the neighborhood of Egypt because there the priestly class was allowed leisure. So we're bored with religious poetry. What do we do? Oh, why not do linear algebra? So this is not uh, 
quite going to explain, but um, I'm going to leave Bacon out. Um, the priests in the temple had surveying instruments lying around. They knew how to use a compass and rule to document uh, what they were doing. So they weren't just sitting around, they were underemployed land surveyors who asked themselves, what else can we do with these instruments? Oh, oh wait a second, I'm going the wrong way. Um, let's take another look at Herodotus, what he really says. Um, I just want to concentrate on the last line. I think from this that geometry was discovered and came to Greece. Um, the word is enteotin. Uh, it's just an adverb saying hereby or whatever. That is, while measuring the fields, this uh, geometry was discovered, not in order to measure the fields. Um, so this uh, interpretation, which you can see every place, that's uh, a projection of our ideas uh, on the source. Herodotus just says there was a connection between measuring the fields and the discovery of geometry. He does not say what it was. So, um, Quick on the uh, internal and external aims. I'm uh, relying on an uh, American philosopher named J. Rosenberg, um, who I will disagree with later, but that's not a point. Um, a game can have internal or external aims. Chess, soccer, what you would call football. Um, there has internal aims, which tell you what the game is about, scoring goals or uh, checkmating your opponent. And there are external reasons for playing the game. We could be fun, fame, fortune, exercise, whatever. Um, what the motivations of the players are or the people who sponsor the sport is, that is not um, relevant for the internal aims. Those are the external uh, aims. Like, what are the internal aims of a game? Soccer, it's scoring goals. Chess, it's meeting your uh, uh, opponent. Um, and it is the internal aims of the game that tell us which players are good and which players are not so good. It's not uh, having a lot of fun, uh, making a lot of money. It's doing something that is internal to the game. So we could ask uh, what makes a good player good or what makes a good physicist good. That will tell us maybe the internal aims of science, we don't have to say, oh, I think it's, uh, it's understanding nature. Uh, we can say, well, let's look at what good scientists do. We can more or less agree what good scientists are, uh, or at least easier to find an agreement about what a good, who is a good scientist than about what good science is. Um, so um, what a good player does well tells us what the goal of the game is. Uh, what is the internal goal of science? What a good scientist does well will tell us what the goal of science is. Of science is. So what does a good scientist do well? Well, here's a quote from Thomas Kuhn. Um, it's fairly isolated. I'm not gonna say this is his considered opinion of when I push him on it, but he does say it. The insulation of the scientific community from society permits the individual scientist to concentrate his attention upon problems that he has good reason to believe he is able, he will be able to solve. Unlike technicians, unlike the engineer, many doctors and most theologians, he means pastors, um, the scientists need not choose problems because they urgently need solution and without regard for the tools available to solve them. So a good scientist is isolated like the priests in the temple um, and he does what he wants to do with the tools available, not what the Pharaoh asks him to do. He's supposed to be measuring land and he's exploring the properties of two dimensional space on the job. So let's see how far we can go with Kuhn. Social conditions, 
Certain social conditions permit the existence of an enterprise with internal aims. This is still cool. Science does not always seek answers to externally determined problems of society. The internal aims of science are conceptualized in terms of tools. The aims are determined by the means and methods available to science. Fourth, was it not considered by Kuhn, whatever determines which tools are available may also determine the internal goals of science. Think about steam engines and thermodynamics. Um, so in, in externalism that is philosophically interesting would give an explanation of the social determinants of the internal aims of science. And that's what we're interested in. And I will finish with that. Thank you, Peter. As our custom, two or three questions at this point. Any hands? Yes, in the back, row over there. It's chasing you with the mic. Thanks for this great talk. Um, I would like to add a little bit of Bourdieu in your final conclusion. So what you see, say that if there is enough momentum in this internal play, the game of science, and enough competition about the tools available and the necessarily following ends, um, would you say that there is sort of a competition that allows scientists to go beyond the definition of ends by just the tools available, but the competition that would fiercely seek new tools that would exceed the, the ones available. So that's, I hope you understand my question. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, um, uh, in any real situation, at one point, you exhaust the possibilities of the, 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 uh, of the methods you have sort of inherited uh, uh, from your education um, and have to develop new ones. Um, that's sort of a, a different question. Um, and it's also a question of, well, okay, let's start analyzing how new methods are developed. Um, and I think you will see, or at least history of science gives many examples that you're taking methods from other places, adapting them to new situations and uh, applying them. Um, so unless you have a sort of a, a really idealistic theory of creativity, um, basically you're going to be modifying things you already have. So um, basically misusing things you have um, that is using them for other purposes. Uh, and discovering new options. And I think uh, you can get pretty far with that kind of model, yes. Yeah, thank you for developing this very interesting perspective. I would like to challenge you with this, see this about a slightly different distinction between external and mm -hmm. internal. External might mean that you want to extend the range of problems that you want to solve and therefore you may have correspondingly have to extend the, way the tools, you have to, may have to develop new tools, whereas the internal operation of science often drives towards simplification. You want to understand things by general principles in a simpler and more coherent manner. Yeah. Okay. Um, as long as we don't get back to revolutionary and, and normal science, I, I'm fine with, with such distinctions. Um, uh, uh, might, Kuhn begins, begins with the scientific community. That's not always the case. Sometimes it's, listen, um, oh, we need this and you gotta do it. If you wanna do your theoretical physics, okay, but you gotta give me enough people to uh, work on the problems that I want worked on. I'm the funding agency. So um, uh, it's only to the extent that science is insulated from direct social pressure that this model works. Of course, <laughs> um, other than that, it says, oh, listen, uh, we want this. You're gonna build an 
interdisciplinary group with 13 different uh, fields, and you're going to all work together even if you, if you don't like each other. And if those are the conditions, then you have to do it differently, yes. But that's external, yeah. <laughs> that's decided by the society. What kind of conditions science is done under, either insulated or uh, directly uh, under control? Peter, I just want to thank you for your talk. This externalism, internalism issue is a very muddled issue. And you are right that nobody wants to talk about it anymore. But that doesn't mean that it is not still on people's mind. You know, I just uh, recently uh, carefully read again for other purposes, this book by Aga on science in the uh, 20th century and beyond, which is a very good book. It's a bit encyclopedic. And the central concept there is the working worlds of science. And it's a very useful concept for understanding science in the 20th century. But what it does, of course, it constantly muddles the issues of internal and external, confusing uh, motives with tools. And, uh, you know, it basically, uh, and it's a very convincing narrative, as one says these days, but it's not a convincing argument because it doesn't distinguish between these fundamentally different concepts. And I think, you know, your paper should be a methodological introduction for any professional historian of science not to, to continue with this muddling of uh, fundamental concepts. So thank you very much. I thought it was very enlightening. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Now we're going to hear the talk that I eagerly anticipate because of my external connections to mathematics and internal ones to Zionism. And that is Leo Corey, who will address us on the subject of two views of excellence in research, two views of Zionist nation building, pure mathematics at the Hebrew University, applied mathematics at the Weizmann Institute. Leo, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here to speak in this conference in honor, in honor of Jürgen Renn. And uh, I will start with three preliminary uh, comments or remarks. First of all, I think that my talk will connect in a very interesting way with the two uh, previous talks. Uh, and I'll let you uh, work out that relation if you want uh, in the comments. Second, um, the topic is a little bit risky in this context. Uh, I didn't know that uh, Gabi Moskin will be the chairman, but I knew that Hanoch Goodfriend will be here. So we have one former president of the university, two former deans, and one uh, a PhD honoris causa of the university. So, you know, everything I will say can be held against me in court. So, I mean, take it uh, proportionally. And uh, the third comment is that because of time, I will be very, very schematic. I will give a lot of labels to things. And as we saw, even the, the, the basic level of internal and external requires a lot of elaboration. So everything, every word that I will say and every person that I will mention uh, um, can be elaborated in, in details. And I will not always do that. And by the way, I'll speak more about the Weizmann Institute than about the Hebrew University, but still the comparison will be there and it's important for my talk. So let us start. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, two um, institutions of knowledge. One established in 1925, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and the other one in 1947, the Weizmann Institute of Science, both in Israel. Uh, and I want to explain that these institutions embodied different views about mathematics and also they embodied different views of Zionism. And there is a connection between both topics. As a matter of fact, uh, it, the, even from here, I can say the topic is broader than what I will speak about because uh, the, the institutions uh, promoted, at least in their ethos, not always exactly in the materialization of this ethos, but in the ethos 
And part of the materialization of it, they embody two views of science and two different views of Zionism. So we, uh, I, this is a joint work partly with uh, Raya Libertan, my colleague at Tel Aviv, and we have published this book in the Springer Brief uh, in History of Science about the Weizsack, which will be at the center of my talk also today. The Weizsack was, as the title says, an Israeli pioneering adventure in electronic computer. It was an electronic computer built in the Weizmann Institute. You can still see it there if you go. Uh, and it was uh, at the time that it was created, it attracted a lot of attention. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it was uh, when it became operational, it was published in the local press. And for my Israeli friends, I bring you a news that appeared in both Ad Sofe and Al Mishmar. Uh, that's also very opposed uh, kind of uh, new political, politically related newspaper. And it says that in the Institute, in the Weizmann Institute, they started the operation of what was called at the time an electronic brain. That was the, one of the terms used at the time. And it created a lot of interest. As I said. Of course, Ben Gurion thought it was important to come and see and talk about it. And not just for the photo op, he was really interested in things that had to do about science. And this is part of the, of the topics that I want to uh, consider in my talk. So here we have Micha Kedem, who was one of the uh, main programmers, and Amos de Shalit, a very important physicist in Israel, uh, also related to the Weizsack. He's from the Hebrew University. Anyway, so this story of the Weizsack happens at the crossroads between two completely different threads of history and if, of historiography uh, that happen to coincide in this point. One thread is the thread of his Israel studies, beginning, let's say, the beginning of the settlements and the, of the immigration, Jewish immigration to Israel, and the history of technology. And uh, at a very specific point in time, uh, this crossroad happens here. Uh, which with the Weizsack. And from the side of the history of technology, let me give you a little, bit of, a little bit of background. So we are talking about the down of the electronic computer era. And even this title already is a title because the first question is, what is really the computer, uh, the electronic computer where we can say here begins uh, the history. And there is a lot of debate about that, but it, the Weizsack, belongs to that part of the story where we have a computer which is digital as opposed to analog, multipurpose as opposed to special purpose, electronic as opposed to electromechanic, binary as opposed to decimal, this is less important. And the most important thing in this story and this part of the story is the idea of store program a, 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 a computer architecture and things that I will talk about as opposed to program or, par or, or a, 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 a more sophisticated version of what is a program a machine. We have, for example, the INIAC that worked in 19, what operation in 1941 in the University of Pennsylvania. It was programmed or programmable, but the, it was not a, a the program was not stored in memory. And this, uh, this change, this revolutionary change, we may say, it, happened. Uh, so first, sorry, I'm not yet there. This is uh, the, the, here, the architects were Ecker and Mockley. They were two engineers. Um, and at some point, the, the effort, the person who joined the effort was John von Neumann. And the, this happens precisely in the process from the ENIAC to the EDVAC. And the main difference between the two machines was the idea of store program, which, happen in the framework of what, of what is usually called the von Neumann architecture. And uh, here we have uh, at some point the, the basic units. I, I will not go into it, but the, 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 the program is given as an input to the machine. It's stored as data in the memory and it works. It, it, this is fundamental for the development of the technology of, uh, of programming. And of course, there is this very famous document, the first draft of a report on the ESVAC where von Neumann describes the architecture. 
Of course, I always have to say in this case that also Turing's machine of 1945, in the, which uh, detects the Samuel Texas proposed electronic calculator, was also stored program. Even though I have claimed in a different framework that the famous seminal paper of 1936 of Turing was not a blueprint for a program of this kind, but of, for a machine of this kind. But uh, this is a different story, and I will not go into it, but I wanted to make promotion to that paper of mine that relates to that. Anyway, so we are in the era of the stored program machine, and the machine that really embodies that idea is the machine of the Institute in Princeton. And uh, for Neumann is a main figure, and that the computer was built between 45 and 561 and was operational until, until June, July of 58. There was an, an important figure is the engineer, Julian Bigelow. And I bring all this story because the Weizsack and Applied Mathematics in the Weizmann Institute is an outcome or is strongly related to this story. The EDVAC and the IS machine was absolutely influential in the early years of electronic computer and all this list that you can see here of places in the United States and outside the United States include machines that were similar to the IIS machine and also our sorry no also our machine never mind is part of that so in order to understand the story we can take this picture as emblematic of what was going on over there. And we have here the four people who were responsible for that machine, and we will see that happening in Israel as well. So the first, of course, is von Neumann, who was the scientist entrepreneur. The second one was Julian Biglow, the chief engineer. And then there were other two important figures. One of them is Robin Oppenheimer, which in this case is the institution builder and the national project leader of the, of the machine. And the fourth person here is Hermann Goldstein, who was the liaison between the project and the military industrial complex. So next picture already brings us into the Weizsack. And the next picture is similar to that. We have here John von Neumann, Bigelow, Oppenheimer, but we have also here Gerald Estrin, who was the chief engineer of the Weizsack, who became the chief engineer, and Efraim Frey, who was one of the main programmers. But the central figure of all this story is Chaim Leip Pekeris, who was the scientist entrepreneur, the leader of the Department of Applied Mathematics at the Weizmann Institute, and a very important figure in science in Israel, not always properly acknowledged. The second person is Gerald Enstrin, who was the chief engineer, like in the other project that I mentioned. This is a very nice picture, but he looks a little bit nerd over there. So he, I, I have a second one where he's less nerdish and uh, he deserves that his picture will be here, right? Now, for Neumann, told, uh, there was a big debate whether it is proper to build an electronic machine in the 50s, where we have a regime of austerity and we have many, many problems, and the, the money is not really available. Is this what Israel needs now, an electronic computer? There was a debate, Einstein, at the beginning, when it started in the late 40s, he said, Israel doesn't need that, don't do that, that's wasted money, and so on. But for Neumann, of course, he was very enthusiastic, and he was also very enthusiastic about Pekeris. And he told Estrin, this guy Pekeris is extremely versatile, hardworking guy. I warranty you that if nobody else in that country does anything to use that machine, he will keep it busy full time by himself. And he was absolutely right in that respect. So if we go to the former picture, we already have the entrepreneur, we have the engineer. So who else is here? The people that you see here. So of course, Weizmann, who was the, uh, the leader, political leader and scientist. Uh, and we will, I will return to him. Here we have Ernst David Bergman, who was a chemist from the Hebrew University, very close to Weizmann until the 50s, when he moved to the other camp and became close to Ben-Gurion, specifically in the nuclear program, to which 
uh, about which uh, Weizmann was hesitant, but he was very important in the Weizsack project. Then Mayor Weizgal, who was Weizmann right hand and without whom nothing happened in the Weizmann Institute. And also Benjamin Bloch, who was also a close uh, uh, assistant to the directive of the, uh, of the Institute. I want to mention here Telma Enstrin. Uh, her name says that he was, she was, um, and since why was he was a very important person in this project. I mention it because one, a part of our work is about the role of women in the early years of computing in Israel. And at least I wanted to say it in this, uh, in this part. So the crossroads comes here where at the time when the electronic machines start to be built, also we have very important development in Israel following the creation of the states. So what we have been doing is about the history of computers and computing in Israel together with Raya. And this has many aspects, history of hardware and semiconductors, software industry, creating a computer savvy society, the rise of computer science as a discipline in Israel, the rise of computer assisted science in Israel. I will speak about this a little bit more. And of course, pure versus applied science which was a main issue in the creation of the Hebrew University and then of the Weizmann Institute and pure as applied mathematics of part of this, women as I said in computing and a broader issue, science, technology, nation building and science, technology and Zionism, part of that broader issue. There is a global context. The global context is the fact that many other machines were at, built at the time. But there is one particular one that I also need to mention, and is the fact that at the same time, there are other three, country, three other countries that are in the same situation. A newly created nation, Taiwan, Ireland, and India, that have to decide what is the role of technology in their creation building. In the year 2000, these three nations and Israel meet as very important nations in the development of the high-tech industry and so on. But there are many interesting questions here about where Israel went at the beginning and where they went at that time. And so, so and many other things. I just want to mention, time is running, of course, and I have not yet mentioned the Hebrew universities, but I will. This topic is well known. And I just want to mention a, a, a quotation for, a, for, from this uh, a article by Kriege, who speaks about the idea of science and nation building and asks or, or focus the entire discussion on this point, how practitioners of science and technology join the local political elites of the newly emerging nations in their pursuit of legitimacy to govern and to help achieve the people's own quest for self-determination, national liberation and prosperity in whatever forms those always contested objectives may take. There is a broad issue here. And my story here is only one example of this. I just want to mention that the, uh, Krieg also said that more recent scholarship has also drawn attention to agriculture, public health, scientific. And so it's not just about weapons and things like that. It's a very broad topic. And there is a long list of works done in the case of Israel, of the third citrus industry, of the, sorry, just a minute. Oops. <laughs> okay, of the citrus industry, um, the role of Begurion, the malaria project in Israel and so on. Again, I want to put this in the broad context. And of course, uh, several years ago, we have a very interesting issue of science in context dealing with all of this. So we published this book in Weizsack, and now we have a second book forthcoming about how Pekeris applied the power provided by the computer in order to create interesting and important science. So let me tell you a few words about Pekeris. And here, after giving this broad context, I come to the question of pure and applied mathematics in Israel in these two institutes. Pekeris was born in Lutania. He moved to the United States. He studied at MIT, a doctorate in meteorology. That was a new topic at the time. Uh, he, studied, he worked in MIT in geophysics, hydrodynamics, astrophysics. And in the war, he was involved in military research. He was very strongly connected to Oppenheimer. And he applied in 1945 to, for a job at the Hebrew University, and he was rejected. 
so he remained in the United. He was a very, he was a true believer in Zionism, and he wanted to contribute to the creation of the nation via science and technology. I mean, we have a lot of evidence about that. He remained at the, as a consultant, and he, this gave him the opportunity to work hands-on on scientific projects with the best machine available at the time. So he joined the committee for planning the Weizmann Institute, and in 48, he came to Israel, went to Israel, and became the head of the Department of Applied Mathematics, just created for him to do that and to build the machine. So there is an interesting question, right? Why he was rejected uh, and his application was not accepted to come to join the Department of Mathematics of the Hebrew University. So now let me tell you something about the Hebrew University and the ethos of pure mathematics in mandatory Jerusalem as established by Edmond Landau, who was the first professor of mathematics in the newly created uh, university. He came to Israel from Göttingen at the time in, in, and stayed for only 18 months. He adopted immediately the name Yehezkel Landau, uh, and he did his best to, uh, to uh, adapt himself to the, you know, it, we're talking about Jerusalem in 1927. That was a, a very remote uh, point of the, of the mandate at that time. So he was, oh, sorry, you don't see it here. But Yehezkel Landau is the name of his great grandfather, who was a great rabbi in Prague, Anodabe Yehuda. And he was very proud about it. And in fact, he, he, this marks the connection between the ethos of Judaism and a certain view of Zionism and that of pure mathematics. You know, there is the Landau style. Uh, he came from Berlin. Those of you who know it, I don't know how to explain, but it is very the, the, the climax of pure mathematics coming from the 19th century in number theory and analysis. So in the, in the opening ceremony of the Hebrew University, he gave a very famous speech. It was in April 1 of 1925 in Mount Scopus, very beautiful place overlooking the Dead Sea and the mountains of Moab. And he spoke about 23 unsolved problems, solved and unsolved problems in the theory of numbers. Of course, he's echoing uh, Hilbert's list of 23 problems. No, no one knew that at the time, I guess, over there. Everybody came to this very important event in Jerusalem. And then he started to speak. In general, AP minus A is divisible by P. So I wonder if it was also divisible. When is it divisible uh, by P to the square? And I always imagine this situation where there were many, you know, the, the um, Herbert Samuel and Allenby was there and Bialik, a lot of people. And, and people came from the issue. It was a very important thing. So I imagine these people like asking themselves, what is this guy talking about? I mean, in, the, in Jerusalem. But anyway, the, the thing is the ethos that he brought there. And uh, this ethos is, was also echoed outside. You know, the, this is a very famous article that, or not famous, became famous, that appeared in the United States, speaking about the fact that the Hebrew University is renewing the, the, the idea. I, I have to read this. I don't know, I, I don't know how much time, but, but this, this is crucial. Okay. So he says, one of our four greatest mathematical geniuses of the world, his professor of getting in, and now he came to Jerusalem to recreate that. And you know, the Hebrew University, even before it was created, they have this journal, the Scripta Universitates Atque Biblioteca Jerusalemitanum. And the, by the way, the editor was Emanuel Velikovsky, who is a, a very interesting person himself. But the thing is that they, in the opening, um, in the opening issue, they speak about Judaism, spiritual Zionism, and science. Yeah, the entire world stands on two pillars, morality and wisdom. The first part of the history of the people of Israel is morality. And now the second, we speak about science and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, this is the ethos that there is in Jerusalem. This, uh, well, I, I will skip it because I, I don't have time. Zelik Brodetsky, who became president of the Hebrew University, he was an applied mathematician. He became president in 49, but was there only for one year. Uh, Hanoch may know more about this. But the thing is that he spoke about the importance of applied mathematics in the same ceremony. 
but no one heard him. We can say there was nothing of this in Jerusalem. And probably this is the reason why he didn't come. So five minutes for the, uh, for the Weizmann Institute. The Weizmann Institute was established in 1947. And for many reasons, uh, uh, Weizmann had been involved in the creation of the Hebrew University, but now he changed the view of what an institution of this kind has to do. It has to be more connected to um, applied uh, science, uh, agriculture, and many other things. I'm doing it very, very schematic. And here you have these two people, the one that created the tradition in Jerusalem, which is Landau, and in, in, uh, in the Weizmann, which is Pekeris, and they have completely different views about Zionism and about mathematics. Here he speaks about why the Gentiles believe that Jews cannot be good engineers. They could, can be good mathematicians, but not good engineers, but we will show them that we can also be good engineers. And so we, we understand a little better why he was not, he was not the kind of mathematician that they wanted to, uh, to have there. So let me, I, I have to skip very quickly. I just want to say that in creating the Weizsa, Pekeris was very wise in using his connections with the Zionist world. I re remind you that this is 1945, the Jews of Britain in America, they have a new kind of commitment toward the state of the, what would become the state of Israel. And they gave uh, not just a lot of money, they gave other things. For example, this computer had this memory, okay, which is the Nemotron. They were three like this in the entire world. Same, same von Neumann architecture, but the one that had this, they were much better machines. There were three, and the guy who did it was some Moshe Cohen in Detroit. And he said, I'm going to give one to my, my friends in Israel. So final thing about Pekeris. Pekeris and his people in the Weizmann Institute were involved in very important projects of science that were based on calculations done with the Weizmann. Uh, for example, this very important article on the grand, grand set of electron atoms, they had to solve a very difficult equation and they developed very interesting methods of linear algebra to invert uh, and to diagonalize uh, matrices. For example, he, they solved a matrix of a uh, 1 million positions, right? And they did it with a machine that had 4K memory. So they, they were not only, they, the machine was very strong at the time, but they were also very good mathematicians and, uh, and programmers. Okay, I, I could say a lot more about the importance of uh, Weizmann, of, uh, of Pekeris, but I think as a schematic thing is enough, I think, to open or to, to give you the idea of what do I mean by different views of science and different views of Zionism. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's uh, very fascinating. Now we're going to move quickly. Oh no. <laughs> Just to demonstrate how young I am, I knew Pekeris. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a photo of Abraham Halevi Frankel from whom I had my course on set theory in mathematics. Now, when, Weitz, when the Weizsack appeared, that was the time when I did my PhD, and we used to go to Rehovot once a week with my file of IBM cards, which we punched ourselves. And then, but I would like to, say, to add something. I think that in this context, being in Trieste, we should mention one Italian, Giulio Racca, who had to leave Mussolini's Italy, he came to Palestine, he was recommended by Albert Einstein, and he founded theoretical physics at the Hebrew University. Now he was one, uh, he was a physicist who did heavy, heavy calculations. And that was before the Weizsack. At the Hebrew, because you are talking about the history of computation. Right. At the Hebrew University, when Raka came to Jerusalem, there was one manual machine. 
calculating machine that you turn the handle. I used them myself uh, during my PhD. There was one such machine which during the day was used by the administration to do all kinds of administrative jobs. At night, Rakach took that machine home and every night he diagonalized a 30 by 30 matrix. That's what he needed for his atomic spectroscopy uh, calculation. So thank you for <laughs> reminding me of my remote <laughs> past. Okay. And now why was Peccaris rejected? I don't know. <laughs> but later on, later on, every appointment in theoretical physics and also in mathematics later on had to get the consent of Albert Einstein. <laughs> That was a little before that, so I don't know if Albert Einstein was involved in rejecting Peccaris. <laughs> thank you for your talk. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Well, yes, I, I anticipated that you would comment on Rakach, and just let me tell you that Rakach is mentioned in our book. He was one of the heavy users of, and he took his students every week, and these students, you were one of them, but I'm talking about the older generation, like uh, the people of the Shavit and uh, the Shalit. And the, at some point, they revolted against Raka and said, We don't want to calculate more spectra and things like that. We want to do our own work, also because it was related to the. But just one word on this Raka was a mathematician in spirit. He did all this work in Raka algebra. He would not have been accepted to the mathematics department, but he was also a great physicist. So he created. Basically, well, we can talk okay, more we have one more question. Yeah. Just a remark. I, I happened to be in Rome a few days ago and I met Giovanni Ciccotti, who uh, wrote a re very recently a book to, together with Gianni Battimelli and uh, Pietro Greco on the history of uh, computation in general, computational science in general. And I would like to point out uh, if I'm it's very interesting that there are a lot of now interest in the history of early computation and the impact of electronic computer on science. There's a lot of studies. And uh, uh, about uh, the women in history of computation, I think there are many, many examples. And it's sort of a spread everywhere in the US, in Europe, uh, that women, especially women uh, formed in math, they were essential in the development of computer science with the new electric, electronic computers. I remember we had a, um, a talk by Dan Frankel uh, at CISA, was a, was a colloquium, and uh, he uh, mentioned the women, the women working in the field, and the, the, there are many, many examples of, of uh, a lot of women. And uh, and uh, both in basic and, and applied sciences. So it's just a remark for. Uh, given the time constraints, we're going to take a break right now. You have 15 minutes, which is to say that we expect that 11:25 we will reconvene for the two talks that remain. Thank you.
flip it. Green is on. Yeah. Got it. Is everybody here? Will all the people who are not here please attend? <laughs> uh, we would like to start because you know the later we start, the later we finish. So maybe we'll skip lunch. We don't start pretty soon. Okay. Uh, look, it's, uh, I didn't realize what I was getting myself into, but I think this is a great session because we have two talks in front of us. And the first one is, I'll start another way. You know, I grew up with the son of somebody whose father was a composer on, of electronic music on a synthesizer in the 1950s. So I'm very interested in these kinds of things. They emitted something like the sound of an English horn, if, if you know what instrument that is. I don't know what it is in German. It was very odd. And there were lots of buttons being pushed. But anyway, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Miles Jackson of the Institute of Advanced Study, which says it all, who is the big expert on these sorts of things. So, sir. Many, many thanks for your turn. Many thanks for the invitation to Tiesta. Uh, I love Italy. My part of my family is from Napoli, the wrong part, but still part of Italy. Herzlichen Glückwunsch, Jürgen. Uh, so, I, I, I always wear shorts. That's why the mathematicians at the Institute of Advanced Study have adopted me because I don't dress like an historian. But for all of my sins, I am a historian, and I thought I would do what we do best, which is to tell a story. Right. So it's April 1925. Uh, we're in Berlin. It's a wonderful city. It's going to turn horrible six years later, but it's still a fun city, just getting out of the uh, depression. Um, and we're listening to a radio. It's a relatively new phenomenon, public radio in Germany. Um, it's a year and a half old. And we're listening to a Beethoven string quartet, the Rosa Quartet playing Beethoven's, uh, I don't know, let's say, uh, Quartet 15 in A minor, Opus 132. Famously, the third movement is the Heilige Dankgesang. And 
we're listening to the radio and we're shocked and horrified that sometimes the violin sounds like they cheated and they put in a flute. Sometimes it sounds like as if they have a clarinet playing the violin part. What the world's going on? Because although Berlin is wild and crazy and some amazing musical genres are being constructed, you don't mess ever with Beethoven in Germany. So it turns out, this is a true story. I, there's some wonderfully irate letters in the archives in Berlin complaining about how dare you change the violin of a Beethoven string quartet. Now, the, the director of the uh, Funkstunde Berlin, which is the first ever public radio station it's in Be Berlin, uh, because, he's, because he's Prussian, felt morally obliged to write responses to all the people who, and there were a lot, about 35 nasty letters, and to put a little article in the newspaper saying, we did not sacrifice, we did not sacrifice, we didn't substitute a flute or a clarinet for a violin. The problem is in early days, they could not, radio in general worldwide, could not transmit tone color all that well. So at times a violin sounded like a clarinet, at times it sounded like a flute. What in the world is tone color? For all my sins of which there are many, I'm a cellist. So all the musical references come from the cello. The open, tone color is determined, and we know this from the work of Hermann von Helmholtz, first essay on this is 1859, he then elaborates on, on the tone layer of 1863. Uh, tone color is what gives the instrument its characteristic, whether it's a cello, whether it's a bass, whether it's a piano, whether it's a trombone. And what that is physically is the upper partials will determine the tone color. So if A is 220, say let's pick frequency fundamental tone 220, the open A string on a cello. The first upper partial will be two times that, 440, the octave. Second upper partial will be three times that, will be 660. Third upper partial, four times that, 880. Luckily, when I talk to the mathematicians at IES, they say, boring, move on, Miles, right? Now, the relative amplitudes, the relative volumes of those upper partials determine whether it sounds like a cello, right? A cello has a different upper, uh, upper partial distribution than say a clarinet or a piano. Some instruments are similar to one another. That's why in the early days, it's difficult to differentiate. Tone color was very, tone color also known as tombre in English and French, klang, farbe in German. Tombres were difficult to reproduce with a, a significant degree of fidelity. Georg Schunemann, who was the uh, head of the Berlin Conservatoire, writes in 1829, sorry, 1828, uh, 1928, I'll get the century right, orchestral pieces were distorted by the radio, such that in one piece, the basses seemed to be absent, in another, the drums. The violins sounded like clarinets. The concert piano sounded like an old square piano. The lower pitches of the cello sounded like horns. The lowest pitches of the double bass would not be broadcast at all. The high range of the violin sounded like a flute, the lower range like a clarinet. The sounds of the percussion instruments, particularly the timpani, would often shrivel away to a faint bang or a dry short beat with an impressive pitch. The interesting thing about this story, since the 1920s, there are amazing debates of which my actors are playing a rather important role on what counts as Knangfaba or Tombre. Is it only the upper partials of a note or is there physiology involved? The answer to that question is there is. And is there psychology involved in the note? These are debates that are going on, particularly in Berlin. One thinks of Karl Stumpf, who's a director of the Experimental uh, Institute, uh, Psychological Institute in Berlin, who is very interested in the story that I'm about to, well, was, he's now dead, the story I'm gonna tell today. The interesting anecdote is this is not just a problem with musical instruments, and it's not just a German problem, it's an international problem. I've and, and the classic example of this is this, is, is this article from Scientific American, it starts out by saying, not so long ago, an elderly gentleman whose aristocratic appearance was impaired by a distinct frown entered a radio store and addressed the clerk as follows. You sold me a receiver, radio, some, uh, some time ago. I wish you would send someone to my home to fix my set. I hear nothing but screeching sopranos. Here is my address. Thank you. That is actually, a I don't say universal, it's certainly a global phenomenon. It turns out you have similar arguments that the soprano in German radio is not as good. Same articles in Britain, same articles in, Ita in, in Italy, same in France, right? And so this is the article from Scientific American by John Ryder, who was an electrical engineer and also a journalist who wrote the article. What are the causes of the infidelity? One, it's the transmitter, the radio station itself. Very few trans uh, transmitters of the, of the late 1920s could transmit broadcast the, the, the upper partials and the correct amplitude. 
Some could, one's in New York good, one's in LA good. Um, receivers often would introduce um, a, a, a sideband suppression. The problem with the transmitters, the microphones weren't as good as picking up the, the signals. For your radio receiver, it was the loudspeaker. Loudspeakers in 1920s were not very good at all. And amplifiers are, were improving, but still weren't where they needed to be. In addition to these technological limitations, there was a political limitation. Radio becomes phenomenally popular, as we all know, in the 1920s. More and more people have radios. Germany goes from, Germany was rather late, 1923. It surpasses Britain in 1928, for the number of radio licenses, second only in the United States, second only in the world to the United States, right? So what happens if you have so many people listen to radios, you have more radio stations. You have more radio stations that overlap, you have interference. So the government needs to put into effect a sideband restriction so that bandwidths for radios were about 9,000 9, hertz, nine kilohertz. Because it's amplitude modulation, you have to do plus and minus the carrier frequency, and so it's 4,500. For those that are opera fans, the high C of a soprano, I mean, if it's equal temperament, give or take a few, uh, a few hertz, is about 1,046.5 hertz in equal temperament. Um, that would mean that the fourth upper partial, which is five times that, and everything above would not be trans transmitted. That's why the sopranos sound as if they screech. That's why the violins don't have the type of fidelity that they could have. So what's going on in my story? Why is it so fun? I, it's fun, I only like telling fun stories because I'm, I'm too old to tell boring stories in my old age. One is about the creation of public radio, which is going on in the 1920s. Like I said, in Berlin, in Germany, the first ever public radio station debuted on the 29th of October, 1923. It's also the creation of radio fidelity. How is it that we can improve this medium? According to Evin Maya, who is the leading acoustician, or one of probably the leading acoustician of the early 20th century, who's working on these problems says, you know, look, we have, we created electroacoustics in order to solve the problems of radio. Right? So you have a creation of a new subdiscipline of acoustics. And you also have a creation of a new musical aesthetic that's dependent upon this genre. It's Neue Sachlichkeit. You probably know it in the art world. There's also a musical version of this that I'm going to talk about. And of course, there's Rundfunkmusik. There's radio music, which is not just about radio played over the music, but, but music that is composed for radio consumption. Because as you probably know, a broadcast, theater, certainly 1920s, a broadcasting room in the 1920s is claustrophobic. It's horrible. It's not like an orchestral setting. Right, it's not like a or or a or a 17th century salon culture room. So you have to think about the architecture of the space. You have to think of the instruments. You have to think of their numbers. So I like to use early radio and the Teutonium to, to probe the heuristic tool of the types of things I think CISA is interested in, the interdisciplinarity, in order to see how it is that Germans solve the problem as well as the Americans, other countries. Um, uh, and, and the various disciplines that you need in order to over overcome the problem. So it's a very brief history of German radio. It's a story about the collaboration between physicists, electrical engineers, physiologists, because speech is important. It's important to recognize on radio dramas who's saying what, um, and musicians. Musicians play a very critical role in my story. And indeed, when in doubt, the Germans invent things and give it ridiculous names that are for four feet long, and the Germans do this. They create the Rundfunkversuchstelle, the experiment, radio experimental station, on the 3rd of May, 1928. There are other stations in the world, other laboratories dedicated to this. This is the only laboratory in the world that's based in the Conservatoire, which is interesting, right? Um, they had some pretty impressive composers working with them in this group. Paul Hindemith, oldie but goodie. Max Butting, Ernst Toch, Viennese uh, a composer, Kurt Weil, best known for, oh dear, I'm not going to sing, but oh dear, that's Kurt Weil, Brecht's sidekick. All of these people are part of Neue Sachlichkeit of music. All of these people play a critical role to Rundfunkmusik, and they do it via experimentations at the Rundfunkversuchstelle. It's a new aesthetic. It's the aesthetic of Neue Sachlichkeit. It was about order, precision, clarity. It's very experimental in nature. It's very anti-expressionism. And they love machines. Hindemith composes with machines in composition. He's also the first person ever to compose for the machine I'm going to talk about, the Trautonium. 
Intellectuals are not to say that musicians are not intellectuals. Other intellectuals are fascinated by the RVS. Bertolt Brecht hopes that, we'll that this new laboratory will improve radio so that the working class will have a means for, for mobilization, right? That is really critical to keep down the radio licensing to make radios more effective, make, it, make um, radios cheaper. Walter Benjamin, everyone quotes, and I want to, if I hear one more time, the, 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 the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, I'm going to scream. That's, that's a decade later. What's interesting about Benjamin here is he actually uses radio as a genre for children's plays, for lectures. So he's interested in the RVS for, for fidelity. And Theodore Adorno, before he goes off on jazz, actually has some very harsh things to, to say about American housewives living in, this is a quote, in the Midwest, if they think that by listening to Beethoven on radio, they understand Beethoven. Right. He's very anti-radio early on, precisely because of problems of fidelity. By the 1960s, he takes it back because radio hasn't, you know, the rise of FM, right? It gets a lot of, but Theodore Adorno does not play a nice role in my story either. So I guess that's okay. So I'm gonna briefly talk about the Tautonium in the 20s and 30s. It has a life even up to today. There's one person in the world who plays it. I'm not making this up. His name is, and you can't make this up, Peter Pichler in, in Munich. Uh, but we can talk about why it was that the Trautonium doesn't have as many play, never really had many players. So that laboratory, the Rundfunkversuchstelle, the idea was to had to study the sounds of voices and musical instruments, see how they're distorted by microphones, amplifiers, loudspeakers, and then correct them. Uh, so the, they were to improve, and this is, by the way, set up in 19, it's great 1920, it's very much a part of the Prussian Ministry of Culture, SPD, kind of liberal uh, intellectual movement. Carbon microphone designs are being improved during this period, as we know. Condenser microphones are being invented, ribbon microphones, moving coil microphones, piezoelectric microphones. So microphones were undergoing a huge development precisely because of the genre of radio is so important. It's fueling the economy. Loudspeakers, the, the key was to, to broadcast with the same uh, pressure over the frequency range. And you use the Rayleigh disk to determine the, the actual pressure that, are, that a, a loudspeaker is. is out. And it's also meant the RVS to create electronic musical instruments. That's part of their goal. You're supposed to improve radios. You're supposed to give us better wonderful music. And by the way, if you can invent the odd electronic musical instrument, they called it back then electric musical instrument, by the way, electronics more used after World War II, this would be great. And that's what Kautzheim's Kautonium is. Now, the one interesting scientific question is how the heck in the world do you study tone color? Right, it's a 64,000. How do you separate out to get the relative amplitudes of the upper partials? You have harmonic analyzers. They're actually invented back by Lord Kelvin earlier on, 1878. He uses it to graph the change in temperature and pressure of, uh, uh, throughout the days. Uh, this is one in 1916 built by the Italian Swiss instrument maker Corradi. It's used by Dayton Miller who's a professor of applied physics at what's called the Case School of Applied Science, now Case Western Reserve. Um, and this is actually the, the lab that he uses. He works with Morley as he gets his dissertation, does his dissertation as in Mikkelsen and Morley. And it's really from Morley and Mikkelsen where they get the notion of using harmonic analysis to analyze properties of waves. Um, if they get a lot better by 1935, this is from Siemens and Halske, now called Siemens. It's in a recording electric harmonic analyzer of them. Uh, so what you would do is that you would measure tone colors, the relative amplitudes of the original instrument and then the, and the broadcast of that instrument. See how it, see and where it goes, the, uh, the distortions. The Americans are good at this. That's why God or the devil invented Bell Labs, right? Uh, Crandall, Went are the two major ones early on. And then classically, Harvey Fletcher plays a very big role, RCA. Radio Corporation of America. In Germany, you have people like Trendelenburg of Siemens, Siemens and Halske, now Siemens, Erwin Meyer, who I mentioned earlier, who's at the Imperial Office of Telegraph Technology in Berlin, as is Martin uh, Grutzmacher, and Werther Walter Gela, famously at the University of Tübingen and, and München in Munich. Um, here is Friedrich Trautwein. That is his Trautonium from 1930. It's the Ur Trautonium, the archetypal Trautonium. He studies physics at Heidelberg doesn't finish, decides to become a lawyer, works in the post office because post office is the, the entity responsible for radio. Um, he then uh, goes off to the war, is a radio, a, a lieutenant in World War I for a, a, a radio squadron. 
So he learns how to work with the radio in World War I, comes get back, gets his PhD at the Technische Hochschule in Karlsruhe in electrical engineering. And in 1930, he's appointed to this laboratory in Berlin, the RVF. He's a docent, he's supposed to teach electrical acoustics there. And he's also supposed to analyze the problem of electrical formation and transmission of sound, distortion, and invent musical instruments. Which he, and, and the idea was it was supposed to be house music, music for the general masses, right? It was to be like the next p a cheap piano, which it never quite was successful at. The key that links early radio history in the Teletonium is tone color. Because the amazing attribute of, of the Teletonium is it can change tone color. You flip a switch, it sounds like a cello. Flip a switch again, it sounds like a trumpet. Flip a switch again, it sounds like a piano, right? So you're studying how to improve tone color. You've got amazing, amazing instruments to study it. And then you say, well, let's, do, let's, let's reverse engineer this. It's actually much more tricky and I can explain why in the discussion than reverse engineering. And you create this instrument. So by having circuits with resistors and capacitance typical for radio, radio equipment, you can produce tone colors that resemble numerous musical instruments. The fundamental frequency was, was generated by a glow lamp circuit that has a lot of upper partials that you can then play with. Uh, and you alter the frequency by changing the resistance of the capacitors That's electrical engineering 101, right? Uh, and then you have dissonant, uh, additional resonance filters that are tuned to different frequencies that you filter out by using high or low pass filters. Again, this electronic engineering 101. So what a, a scientist now would say, it was you, you generate the sound by subtracted sim synthesis as opposed to additive. The key characteristics, which what times were disadvantage as, uh, disadvantageous as well as advantageous, and it depends upon when in history it's being used. On the one hand, it can mimic uh, traditional musical instruments and human vowel sounds. On the other hand, it can create new, wonderfully modernist sounds simultaneously. And both Trautwein and his assistant Oscar Zala say, from the very beginning, we can do both. But the interesting thing is, it depends on the historical period, which bit's going to be emphasized. So it starts out with, they start out by making vowel sounds. This is from Zala, again, the assistant. And we tried out many beautiful things there at the RVS. Uh, he once arrived with a thick transformer and said, I brought this along, now let's connect it up and then we'll have a capacitor, just a small one. And all of a sudden we were amazed to hear, ooh, oh, a, oh, ooh, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. We were speechless, unlike the Teltonium. He too, of course, naturally we had thought about it, that it should work, it ought to work, but then when it does work, you exclaim, wow. You might say that it was the revelation for every one of us. We now had a range of tone colors. So if you played with a U, a U, you get the sounds U, U, U. If you play with an A, you get A, A, A. And indeed the similarity between certain vowel sounds and certain musical instruments were key because the U was like a bassoon, the O sounded like a clarinet, the A like an English horn, the E like an oboe, Several shades of the A sound like a saxophone. Mixture of U and E was like a cello. The mixture of A and I like the violin. Wow, it's Christmas time. So what they did, what Trautwein does, is that he compares the work of people like Trendelenburg and Bachhaus on oscillograms of vowel sounds, as well as musical instruments, Bachhaus did violins, and compare it to the oscillograms that his Trautonium is generating. And he says a comparison of the resulting vibrational forms of the Trautonium's formants or the bits of the upper partials that determine the tone color. With the characteristic oscillograms of the musical instruments and speech sounds reveal a noticeable conformity. Indeed, this is actually his circuit for the physical, uh, physiological, fundamental experiment. The Tautonium is an electrical analog of the mechanism of sound creation of the human speech organs. The scientific significance lies in the physical, physiological impression of the synthetically generated sounds compared with the timbre of numerous musical instruments and speech sounds. This suggests that the physical processes are related in many cases, right? So interestingly, although the, the music is a bit more interesting and more, but I'm more than happy to talk about the science, the Teltonium is also a scientific instrument because of the debate in the 1920s about the formation of tone colors I talked about. Helmholtz famously said that the tone color of vowels is determined by resonance in the oral cavity. If you go ooh, e, ah, right, the vowel, it's the shape of your mouth that will determine which of the upper parcels are reinforced via resonance. There's a, and, and the same with musical instruments, that the wood and the design of, or, if it were, or the metal, depending on the instrument, that's the one that selects which, which of the upper parcels gets, gets uh, enhanced. There is a physiologist called Budama Hemann in, in Königsberg, 
um, who says, no, Helmholtz is wrong. It's not about reinforcement. It's about the glottis sending, in, uh, sending pulses of air through the mouth and that that initiates vibrations in the mouth that die out, that decay, the eigenfrequencies, if you want to use sexy terms, and that these transients of the eigenfrequencies determine the tone color. Cloudfine was convinced that his instrument proved that Hamann was correct because you're sending electric impulses. The impulses will decay, right? It, they'll, and they'll form transients, and that's what determines the tone color. Footnote for those of you that Helmholtz, who, who fear that Helmholtz is wrong, he's not. You never want to say Helmholtz is wrong, particularly when Germans are present. It turns out that Hamann's theory and, and, and Helmholtz's theory are actually the same, right? They're one's a limiting case of the other. And uh, indeed, uh, fairly early on, Lord Rayleigh was to say precisely that. Um, here is the group, that's Hindemann, the ugly one right here. That, uh, sorry, Hindemann is right there. Todd find the ugly one right here. And that's Oscar Zala, who becomes the virtuoso on the instrument. That's the first piece ever composed for, by, for a Tautonium by Hindemann. He composes a number of pieces for the work. And this is the kind of the archetypal Claudonium. There's a, 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 a string that you depress, you connect the electric circuit. This is the volume, right? Uh, a lot of times you can hook it up into a radio circuit itself, or you can have a, a loudspeaker. And these dials, oh, I, actually, there's technology, I can do this. I'm, I'm a Luddite, now I lose all credibility. These dials determine what of the upper frequencies are added. So that's how you change the tone color. And this is from 23 to thank goodness for YouTube, because it's on here. This is the first ever official recording of a Trautonium. It's in the Musik Hochschule in Berlin, the Conservatoire. Ich möchte Ihnen nun mir das Trautonium vorführen. Now that was semi-impressive. They were the tone colors are a violin, viola, and cello. Yeah, yeah, it gets better. They work on it. They think they have something interesting, and so they decide to make some changes. Rather than just being electrically powered, they they add a battery because a change in electricity can, if you have a surge, can hugely change the the the, the frequency. They change a glow lamp with a thyrotron, which is a radio signaling device, uh, to produce the fundamental frequencies. And in 1933, you get the false Trautonium or the Trautonium of the people uh, that was met, that's, that's actually funded by Telefunken. Um, and the idea is this is supposed to be house music par excellence. And this is the design, the formants, you do, you change the formants by dial F or KL. Um, and this is a much more advanced piece. It's Paganini played, but it's only three years after the tape you just heard. <laughs> This is the radio uh, Trautonium, also sponsored by Telefunken. Uh, and there's Oscar Zala. It now has two board and many more dials. The range of tone colors it produces increases exponentially. This is the concert Trautonium. The idea is that we want to carry it along to venues. The radio Trautonium stayed in the radio station. This is a performance in the Berlin Philharmonie of 1940. Um, and this right here. De Den Haag wordt door professor Oscar Sala een demonstratie gegeven op het trautonium. Deze uitvinding van troutwijn is een melodisch instrument waarvoor de elektriciteit slechts de kracht levert tot het voortbrengen van de toon. De bespeler regelt de stroom en de trillingen en kan deze trillingen in oneindige schakeringen en klankkleuren vervormen. 
De uitvoeringen die hier te landen met dit instrument worden gegeven, staan onder leiding van generaal muziekdirector Tsang, dirigent van het Stedelijk Orkest van Berlijn. Het is me een heel bijzondere vreugde, anlässlich mijn eerste auftreden in Holland. Niet nur dat neue elektrische muziekinstrument, dat Tortonium, voorvoeren te kunnen, maar gleichzeitig ook voor een jonge Deutsche Komponist in te treden. Harald Gensmer had eigens voor dat Tortonium een concert met orkest geschreven en dit werk werd ik in mijn beide concerten in Utrecht en außerdem in Niederländischen Rundfunk zum eerste maal außerhalb Deutschlands te gehoor brengen. Ik hoop dat Ihnen dat nieuwe instrument gefallen möge en we werden ons gestatten nunmeer einige proben praktisch voor te voeren. Briefly, uh, in 1937 and 1940, the government had changed by then, as we all know. Goebbels shuts down the RVS in 1935, uh, but the mission is transferred to the Conservatoire. It's headed up by Trautwein, who now becomes a full professor. The Hochschule für Musik, as well as the Heinrich Herz Institute, was also important for this kind of work, cleansed of Jews and socialists. Trautwein and, and Zahl are extre extremely op opportunistic. Trautwein becomes a member of the Nazi party on the 1st of April, 1933. That's the same date where the famous the, the, uh, the, the protests of don't buy by Jews that day, he goes and registers uh, to become a member of the party. He also joins the Stromabteilung. He's not a very nice human being. Um, he assists the Nazi party in designing acoustical setups for the massive gatherings at Nuremberg, Stettin, Vienna. They meet with Goebbels because it's important that you have Goebbels inside the tent, so to speak. Who says, mach mal weiter. He's fascinated. He has a private, uh, private viewing. He wants to know if it can be used for mass rallies, which, of course, they say, yes, it can be. And the, con uh, the concert trautonium and the likes come, uh, and, the, and also the uh, wonderful the, the, the radio uh, thought it was funded by the Reichskammer Musik. The aesthetic it generated was, to use Goebbels' terms, steely romanticism. That's exactly what the Nazis wanted in electronic musical instruments. It was featured during the, uh, during the commercials of the uh, Berlin Olympic Games on the radio, for example. So it had a very high profile during the Third Reich. It was the most important electronic musical instrument during the Third Reich. And in the archives of the Deutsche Museum, there you can actually see for those I can read well, that's the, the Trautonium they present, they played for Dr. Goebbels in 1935. It just came out because the notebook had been lost and they found it last year. Uh, now, briefly to, to conclude, after the war, it's generally bad if you are a Nazi to get a job. Kautwein cannot get a job. He builds an electronic mu uh, monochord for the very important studio for electronic music, um, uh, music in, in, in Cologne. That's famously where a guy called Karl Heinz Stockhausen will be director in a few years. He's actually an apprentice um, for them. There are huge fights with Maya Eppler, who's the physiologist and, and physicist who works with the Cologne School, and Herbert Eimat, who's the initial director, about the role of the instrument in composition, the role of the composer while playing and improvisation, I can talk about in the discussion if you want. Uh, in the end, uh, Trautwein creates one of the first sound engineering curriculum in Germany. It's in, uh, in Düsseldorf now, the, I think it's the Schumann uh, Conservatoire. Um, after the war, it's used to create strange futuristic sounds because the steely romanticism is not something you want after the end of the Third Reich. Um, uh, it also is used in radio dramas. One of the famous radio dramas that's featured in it is Faust Eins, it's by, it, which is directed by Paul Dessau. That is the first major performance of Faust after the war. And so the idea is how do you get an instrument that was affiliated with the Nazis to do something that's not Nazi-esque? And that took a lot of thinking, and I talk about how that was done more, by, by Zala. Trautwein disappears. Everything now is all Oskar Zala, the assistant. Um, it also can, it plays the F trumpet in Box Brennenberg Concerto Number no. 2 because they couldn't find anyone after the war in this one village. It's also the, uh, the Graz Glackenklavier in Wagner's Passifal. It does that in the, uh, in the, in the opera house and now the Deutsche Oper uh, in Berlin. 
This is the last instantiation, the mixture of Cloutonium, that's Zala. He builds it by himself, 1952. It produces the bells and hammering in Meistersinger von Nuremberg in Bayreuth, of all places. It's part of Wieland Wagner. Wagner is of the Wagner family. It's very important for Meistersinger von Nuremberg, which was of all the Wagner uh, operas Hitler's favorite, that it was to be as minimalist as possible. So basically, it was just the Trautonium playing the bizarre pieces. And there was, and so the idea was that it, the idea was to, to strip any memory of the Third Reich from Bayreuth. I can talk about the reviews if you want. Also for industry films, particularly scientific films, um, it was also used for music and cultural films. Under the, I is the first film about homosexuality in post-war Germany. Um, it was the only musical instrument in two ballets, Payan uh, and Electronics, by, that was choreographed by the great George Balanchine in New York. Uh, again, it was the only instrument for that. And I always start by saying people probably have never heard the Tautonium, probably heard it, have never heard of it. And, and when you probably heard it, if you've heard the birds, the birds are not really birds. Uh, they're, whoops, I knew I was gonna blow. I always blow the final thing. Maybe, oh, maybe it won't work. If it doesn't work, it's not a problem. Maybe it will work. Oh, here we go. Being a Luddite is terrible. It's not real birds. The an older Oscar Zala. So just to, literally to conclude, I mean, this is a story about the rise of 20th century science, which in a sense was massively organized because of the rise of, of, of high industry, because of also of, of World War I, and that it's also about the social spaces of where science is being done. It has to be done in a metropolis. You're not gonna find this bits of all of these bits of, of expertise anywhere other than places like New York City or Berlin or Paris or London, right? Um, and so it's a story about the ways in which various communities, which either had never come together before or are coming together in new ways to generate a new musical aesthetic that actually was rather popular for a very long time. And the aesthetic changed with the time via the instrument. And finally, I think the Tautonium gives us a reason to pause about the ways in which disciplines which seem to be so entrenched now are actually far more malleable than they were back then, than they seem to be now. And on that, I'll end because I went over that. Sorry. Thank you very much. As usual, three questions. If there are anybody? Leo. Yes, and then the gentleman. Uh, when you start, you're going to be... Neue Sachlichkeit. Yeah. So I, that cannot be by coincidence that I chose this name that has to do also with painting and Absolutely. other things. And then I ask myself first, this is the first part, but the second part, when it comes to the incorporation to the Nazi party, but still they have this background that connects them in terms of the contents of what they do to something that the Nazis are trying are to clean. So. No, exactly. So the first bit is that they absolutely are choosing a kind of the lefty Neue Sachlichkeit. Paul Hindemith is, you know, SPD is exactly kind of Weimar Republic lefty, center lefty intellectual. Um, and so they're picking up the notion of precision of order, particularly anti-expressionism. But that's the real main key that we're not going to do with the expression. We want to do a new genre of music, just like which uh, can be microtonal, although Hindemith's not, he's actually anti-microtonal. Um, that's different from what has gone on in, in Western music, but also different from Schoenberg, right? And different from that, from that genre. Um, Hindemith has a complicated relationship with the Nazis, right? The Nazis kick him out. Um, he becomes entata to Kunz, he becomes degenerative music. Um, he unfortunately signs an oath to Hitler so that he doesn't fall totally out of favor. He goes to Turkey to teach uh, in a conservatoire. So the interesting bit is how malleable, my, the moral is how malleable the instrument is. That if you wanted to play microtonal music, we can do microtonal music. If you want it to be house music, we can do house music. If you wanted to make strange bird sounds we, and, and as other kind of sci-fi movies like the theremin, we can do that as well. So it's the verse of the notion that even though it's, it's constructed in the crucible of a left-wing uh, 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 Weimar Republic, the instrument is phenomenally flexible and not determined totally by the context in which Thanks a lot. Um, 
the story in, in popular music is that the kraut rock scene kind of rejected the classical kind of volks music and and began to use strange futuristic mm -hmm. uh, ahistorical noises but mm -hmm. were they actually using something like the troutonium and was they, there interestingly no i mean there are so the, the 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 group that does actually embrace electronic music and folks music is kraftwerk and kraftwerk is very much they don't use the troutonium but they use the work of the of the a school studio for electronic music so they, and they see themselves as, I mean, it's a very kind of dangerous stance that they do historically, right? We all know that, oh, we're not really Nazis, but we kind of look like we're proto-fascist. They're the only ones who embrace folks music and electronic music. Well, uh, uh, Orange Tangerine does, uh, yeah, Orange tanger Tangerine, Tangerine Dream, that's it, is the other group that, but you're right, most of the people who uh, are interested in, electro, uh, are in, in, in the next generation don't draw upon this. Where this gets its, I say, where this gets its really, its, its impetus are, are from films, uh, doing backgrounds for films. Uh, uh, and certainly it, this is important to the development of the Moog synthesizer because Herb Deutsch say, said that their subharmonium that they used for the Moog synthesizer was based on the Kraut form. That's last, where the other area is. Last question, Jurgen. I just very shortly, no, the question is Karl Orff. I mean, there was a musical aesthetics that was sort of, Cal off, you know, there was a off. Huh? Call off. off. Ah, yes. Yeah, you know, because I'm, I'm saying this because uh, the Nazis were clearly ambiguous with regard to their attitude to technology. Right. On the one hand, you know, they gave themselves the image of being very traditional, you know, uh, Deutsche mm -hmm. Physik and things like right. that. But whenever it suited them, they used, you know, the most uh, advanced technology Absolutely. for their purposes. So, and uh, this is one of the ambiguities okay. of the Atonium. And we know it from visual arts. And here the question is, you know, you had uh, people like Karl Orff who were, you know, looking for ancient and pure sounds. Uh, Kamina Burana. And uh, Kamina Burana. So the question is, is there any, you know, discussion uh, about this, uh, you know, did Karl Orff uh, oppose the Tratonium, for instance? As no, Karl Orff does not, but we, you have a lot of modern composers who are not well known, like Harald Grenzma, who basically say that this is, this is a way in which we can use technology uh, in ways that technology is used by the Third Reich um, to increase musical aesthetics for the good of the, for the good of the Reich and the German people. Certainly the Germans did not just say, we're gonna play Bach. They allow modern composers to compose with this instrument, right? Microtonal music is a problem. They don't want that. Uh, but the, there is about, I can, I, I, I have a list. There, not, Hindemith was the, the leader of all of them, obviously. But there were about 15 modern composers who composed for the Trautonium during the Third Reich without a problem. And where this fits in is your point to that point is the larger argument of what uh, Hef calls reactionary modernism, right? That you use bits of technology where you see fit and you kind of close your eyes if you're not happy with it, but the greater, it's, it's a very popular and powerful movement that the Nazis used. And certainly I would put uh, uh, Trautwein in that, in that group, that he was very, very, very much, he always talks about how capitalism and what the engineers do in the United States and Britain are horrible. We serve the state and we have technology for the state and was rewarded for it. Okay, we're, I think we have one more talk. And that is, thank you very much. This, this, this talk was invigorating. Okay, our next talk is by Tilman Zawa, who is a historian of mathematics at the University of Mainz. And he will speak to us about mathematics as a tool, Galilei and Huygens on the hanging chain. Tilman, the floor is yours.
Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, uh, Jürgen, ha happy birthday. Also, um, Glückwunsch. Thank you. Um, I will uh, talk about um, a famous problem in the history of calculus um, that arises in, uh, very explicitly in May 1690. Uh, by a challenge that Jakob Bernoulli uh, places in the Acta Ereditorum. He says, to find which curve is made by a slack rope that is freely suspended uh, in between two fixed points. Um, I'm assuming here that the line is perfectly flexible in all its parts. Um, in uh, the September issue of the same year, Leibniz repeats the question. He mentions that it was a famous problem going back to Galileo and challenges everybody to come up uh, to try their method and come up with a solution within a year. And in 1691, a year later, three compatible solutions, namely by Huygens, uh, Johann Bernoulli and by Leibniz himself are published in the Acta. And uh, from a modern point of view, uh, the line here, the linea catenaria is a hyperbolic cosine um, uh, that is a transcendental curve in the sense of Leibniz's new uh, calculus. Um, the way I've written it here, the uh, hyperbolic cosine, uh, this is uh, the notation is from the late 18th century. So this is a very modern notation. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to uh, say about something about four things. First, I want to make a few comments on uh, the original formulation with Galileo. Can one using a hanging chain um, to represent the shape of a parabola. And then second, I will comment on uh, the very young Huygens geometric proof that the hanging chain cannot be a parabola. And then um, very briefly um, on three and four, I will look at Huygens exploration of the properties of the catenary on the basis of his result, earlier results. And then um, also take a look at Leibniz's solution as, um, as he was applying his new rules of differential calculus. And then I will conclude with some remarks on mathematization. So does the hanging chain represent the problem? Um, the problem, as Leibniz uh, said, was um, prominently discussed in uh, Galileo's Discordsi uh, on the second and fourth day. And as uh, uh, we all know, uh, there are uh, some manuscripts in which he analyzes the chain. And um, I'm for the next slides, everything I'm going to say about Galileo, I take from this um, paper by Ren and Damro and Riga, uh, Simone Riga um, on hunting the white elephant, um, where they also speculate of what the three um, participants of the discourse would discuss on the fifth day. Um, so um, I'm just going to give one quote from the fourth day of the discourse where Salviati says that the court stretched more or less tightly assumes a curve which closely approximates the parabola. And then later he says that using parabolas described with elevations less than 45 degrees, the chain fits its parabola almost perfectly. And then um, they say, then with a fine chain, one would be able to quickly draw many parabolic lines upon a plane surface. And Salviati says, certainly, and with no small advantage, as I show you, shall show you later. Um, now there's this wonderful edition of the MS-72 that allows everybody to kind of explore these notes and, and, uh, for themselves. And if you look at it, indeed, you find these uh, uh, manuscripts here that um, look like hanging chains. And if you print them out and hang, uh, put a chain on top, they fit exactly. Um, here's another one. And as, as uh, um, was shown, um, there's manuscripts that fit, fit to, uh, to, on, on top of each other. Um, and clearly Galileo here explores um, the, the catenary, the, the line of a hanging chain in the context of his um, attempts to understand uh, the, uh, the, the motion of, of uh, 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 the tra uh, trajectory. Um, then there is this very intriguing um, thing that um, 
uh, it was pointed out uh, that uh, some things you wouldn't see in the facsimile if you don't go to the, back to the originals that are uh, these uninked construction lines um, that you only see when you actually look at them. Um, and uh, this particular page um, uh, shows, a, shows a lot, it shows uh, uh, many of them. And here you see, uh, you, you can uh, recognize two lines um, that are not on top of each other and by, by the uh, uh, numbers that you see here on the on the right, you see this uh, sequence of square numbers. So clearly, he's uh, looking here at parabola uh, sort of uh, curves. Um, indeed, if you um, look at these two uh, curves, he does here exactly what he says he does in the discarsi. He has these two curves, and if you plot, if you um, fit them uh, against a, uh, a cosine, a hyperbolic cosine, or a parabola. You see in the, in the upper limit, in the upper image, they, they fit perfectly. And if you fit the other one in the parabola and the other one to a, to a cosine, uh, they don't fit at all. You can't fit them. So clearly one of those lines is a parabola, one is a catenary. And, and then uh, uh, the, there are other manuscript pages, uh, very intriguing ones, where Galileo tries to understand what is going on with the chain. Why is that maybe the case? And here's one where he's... Um, uh, indicating uh, a certain construction. You see this uh, wedge-shaped uh, drawing and then numerical um, uh, computations. There's another one where you uh, see the, also on, on, uh, so at the top of the image, you see something like a sketch of uh, a, a situation where there's uh, four threads uh, um, uh, holding uh, three weights. Um, like I've uh, shown on the right hand side picture. And again, there is numerical uh, computations and they have all been uh, uh, reconstructed. And uh, clearly what um, Galileo here is trying to find is the equilibrium solution for this uh, kind of situation. And it turns out that this is a very tricky uh, a problem. If you coordinatize this as we would later do um, and then uh, compute the uh, uh, the curve that um, the um, uh, center of mass would do, it, it gets this first degree algebraic equation. And uh, this is uh, clearly not what Galileo does here. And it's probably beyond of what he could have done. And it's a typical problem that we would use with uh, uh, means of calculus. Um, so what did Galileo conclude about the catenary? Um, first, um, his analysis of the hanging uh, chain, uh, weight chain, uh, must have remained inconclusive. Um, um, but Juring says in the, in the end, he convinced himself for reasons that are dynamical reasons, the analogy to the, to the parabola, that the hanging chain in the end can be taken as a representation of the parabola. And, but clearly in the discourse, he says that um, he, he's, he's uh, you know, that this, uh, works approximately well if the uh, the chain is not too steep. Too steep. All right. Um, so second, um, proving that the catenary is not a problem. Um, so the very young Huygens uh, in 1646, so he's 17 years old. Uh, it's, one, it's actually his first scientific manuscript uh, that has been um, only published in his, in his uh, collected works in 1888, uh, gives a proof that the uh, catenary cannot be a problem. The problem was raised in correspondence earlier, probably um, by Massen, but he also later says that uh, he was stimulated maybe um, also with Stephen. So for instance, in a letter to Leibniz from 1691, Huygens recalled Stephen's works and wrote uh, that this commentator, however, is wrong in his commentary to the statique par cordage on the subject of the curvature of the line made by his weights, which curvature, curvature he pretends to be parabolic and that he would have a proof of it. So what the young, young Huygens will prove is the following. It's the, the crucial bit of the proof is the following theorem. If we uh, have that situation that we see here, uh, two fixed points and then uh, two hanging weights uh, with equidistant uh, uh, threads, uh, if we extend the outer threads um, so that they meet in a point of intersection, uh, they meet in a point and, uh, because of the hanging diameter of weight and pendula gravitatis diametro, 
Uh, that is a vertical line that goes through the center of gravity of the two suspending masses. Um, so that's the, the, the crucial ingredient that uh, uh, Huygens needs for his proof. And um, I will rush through, um, even though I realize we're eating into a lunch break, I will rush, rush through his, his proof here, just to give you uh, an idea of, of how he does that. Um, so the idea of the proof is to imagine that the weights move. Um, uh, so imagine that these uh, uh, two um, weights, um, you know, they, they, they can be uh, moved like this. Um, and then uh, the, the middle point of their uh, connected line describes a curve, and that curve will uh, turn out to be an ellipse. And Huygens needs to prove that it is an ellipse and that the lowest point is the one that uh, is given by the hanging diameter of the weight. Um, so he uh, starts by um, formulating a number of axioms. The first axiom is that the, uh, that the weight is, is all uh, you know, perpendicular. It's not kind of uh, uh, oriented towards the center. Uh, the second one is the crucial one. The, the solution, the mechanical equilibrium is unique and it's given by the, by the condition that the center of gravity is at its lowest point. Um, Three and four basically say that uh, it's, a, it's a unique extendable solution. You know, you can take the, the scenery and, and, and uh, uh, extend it uniquely. And then there is a fifth axiom uh, where he says the finite part of the circumference of a circle of infinite magnitude is uh, all, as good as a straight line. And um, what he's needing this for uh, will become uh, clear later on. So these are the four axioms that basically characterize uh, the problem from a for, for his mathematical analysis. And now he, uh, he does uh, the, his geometric proof. And as I said, I will rush through it just to give you an idea of, uh, of the complexity um, of, of, the, of the problem. So the first lemma that he needs is that uh, if he uh, looks at this motion of, uh, of, this, of this rod, um, it, it is a, an, an ellipse. So um, the, the two blue lines are the, um, the guiding lines, and then there is a, a line between N and C that uh, in this way moves along these guiding lines. And the midpoint describes this elliptic curve. Um, and uh, the first part of, of, the, of the proof is he needs to show that this is an ellipse. Now we know there is means to um, you know, actually draw ellipses that go back to these things where you kind of have these guiding rules and you, you but the, the the tricky thing here is that they're not at orthogonal angles and um, so what does he do uh, well he needs to show that it is uh, an ellipse um, he constructs a diameter a, conju a conjugate diameter um, and then he uses um, basically uh, proportions the theory of proportions uh, in order to show that um, here the line bf and fl the, the, the rectangle the product of those two is to the square of df as the um, as the, the semi uh, uh, semi uh, axes are, um, and this is uh, then invoking a, a, a theorem from Apollonius Conics from the first book of uh, Conics, and this actually shows that this curve is an ellipse. Uh, so the second is that he's constructing a tangent to the ellipse. Um, again, um, I'm just showing you. And uh, his, his sketch and in his proof, he again uh, uh, goes back to conics and uh, invokes a, a theorem from uh, 131. And then um, Lemma 2 uses these two things. Um, uh, remember, he, you know, the, the problem that he has is he, he wants to, uh, you know, in, in his mind, he has these two moving um, uh, lines uh, in, in between the, the uh, uh, connecting line, and the midpoint is now moving on an ellipse. And he wants to show that this ellipse, uh, the tangent or the normal to that ellipse is, lang is, is orthogonal, basically. So he has a, a theorem, another theorem, where he's kind of constructing um, lines that are orthogonal to these guiding lines and then um, uh, 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 create a normal to, to the tangent. And again, um, uh, I just rushed through here. He's, uh, um, uh, looks at similarities of triangles in order to uh, get these proportions, and then um, he, he can uh, 
prove this, this geometric theorem. And now all he has to do is he applies it back to the, uh, to the original problem and, um, uh, and concludes that uh, it's manifestum, the, the two set weights cannot hang in any other place than when the extended lines EA and DB intersect each other in the hanging diameter of the weight. So that's basically the, the, the heavy weight of the proof is to show that this elliptic curve that the, that the midpoint is doing, uh, the, the normal to it is, is, uh, is meeting the, uh, the intersection of the, of the neighboring line. Um, uh, so if we compare Galileo and Huygens, uh, so Huygens succeeds in, uh, in solving this problem uh, on the one hand, because it's more simple. He only uses two weights instead of three that reduces the number of degrees of freedom. On the other hand, it's asymmetric. It's more complicated because the, the fixed endpoints are not in the same height. Um, uh, in order to show, show what he wants to show, he needs to kind of go from these hanging weights to infinite rods. Uh, and then the final thing is a, a proof by contradiction. He assumes that the, the uh, chain line is given here. Um, and if there is a parabola going through three points, then the theorem of the hanging weights implies that it cannot go through the other uh, hanging point. Chain. So this is the, the, his final result. Um, and uh, uh, so far so good. Now, uh, what happens in 1690 when the problem becomes explicit, um, Huygens very, very quickly, already in 9 October, uh, writes to Leibniz um, and gives uh, uh, the result in a chiffre, says I've solved the problem, and can we not kind of uh, agree on, on discussing this before the end of that, of that year that he gave us? And this is the chiffre that, that he sends him. Um, and uh, here on the, uh, on, on the lower images you see, uh, what he actually does, he, he takes the, the, this, uh, this theorem of the, of the hanging diameter of the weight in order to construct that curve. You, know, you, uh, you, you can construct the, the curve of the, of the chain by uh, using the fact that the tangents or the extensions of, of neighboring lines meet always um, uh, you know, in the vertical of the midpoints. Um, this, is, this is the basis of his construction. Um, we know um, from from uh, Huygens' uh, collected works that were edited by uh, none other than Korteweg, um, uh, that he's done very sophisticated uh, geometric constructions on the basis of that, of that theorem. Um, and here you see, you know, compares, compared the original scientific manuscripts of Huygens with the edited version of it. Um, uh, so um, that's fine. So now uh, the, the fourth point, um, if we look at Leibniz, uh, who had, uh, remember, he had kind of picked up on, on Jakob Bernoulli's challenge and say, this is something that uh, I can use, uh, uh, can solve with my new calculus, and I challenge everybody. Um, he, in, in fact, gives a solution. Um, in fact, um, he, what, what he does in his published papers is he discusses the properties of the, of the catenary in terms of the logarithmic line, what he turns the line, what he calls the linear logarithmic we, we call it the E function, the exponential function. And he, in any case, you know, we, the cosine hyperbolic is the arithmetic means of two um, exponential functions. And he gives a, uh, you know, as, as you see here on, on, on the figure, he gives a, um, a, a, a construction of that line. He does not tell um, uh, in his publications of why this is a solution, nor how he um, had obtained it. Um, what he does say, and that's sort of a little funny, he says that it may not be unpleasant to observe from my construction, the wonderful and elegant harmony of the curve of the chain of logarithms. This may be helpful since during long journeys one may lose one's table of logarithms in case of need the catenary can serve in its place. So he's kind of suggesting that uh, the, 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 the chain line can be used in, as a tool in a different way and I have this picture that you know there's a, a ship uh, shipwrecked in, in the storm, and they use their, they they lose their logarithmic tables, and then they can still use the, the anchor chain uh, to to get the logarithm. But clearly, this is not a practical uh, solution, and it's uh, uh, but but it has been shown how this can be done. The problem is to to find the the right coordinates here. Um, what's more interesting, maybe, and this is uh, uh, the last thing I want to say about Leibniz, is there are manuscripts in, in the Leibniz archives. The document his own attempts to 
uh, come to, to terms with this problem. And, and one particular page is, is dated uh, January 1691, so well um, later than the, his challenge in the ACTA. And if you see, I, I, I just uh, show here the, the, the drawings, he's actually looking at the very same situation that uh, Huygens looks at. Um, so he has these points F and F, these are the fixed points where the nails are kind of uh, in the wall. And then the, the points, what is it here, I, are the, the, the movable weights. And um, in fact, it turns out that you can apply uh, his, his rules of differential calculus to this problem. And he does so, but he doesn't get anywhere because the algebraic equations that turn out are 12th degree or so, because it's the asymptote, the asymmetric situation. And he, he applies his calculus, but he doesn't get him anywhere. And then it's only with other manuscripts and, and, and when he's looking at the, at the line as a continuous line that he finds the correct uh, uh, solution. Okay, um, so just to sum up, so the first point in the early history of the catenary, the hanging chain is seen through the lens of the theory of conic sections. So that's sort of the, the basic framework. After all, the, the parabola is a conic section and the chain line by Galileo is seen as a means to represent a problem. Um, so it's a, it's a material tool to, to draw these uh, lines, but then the problem of accuracy induces him to investigate the properties of that chain itself. So sort of the tool turns into an object of investigation for him. And then um, what Huygens does, he proves that the hanging chain does not follow a parabola. And, and, and ironically, in Huygens' proof, he heavily uses uh, the theoretical means of the Apollonic uh, theory of conic sections. So he uses conic sections to prove that the chain is not a conic section. Um, uh, and in, includes also some idealization, but this is uh, unproblematic here because he only is interested in the local terms. Now, uh, when this problem actually is formulated explicitly in 1690, several years after Leibniz publishes his rules of differential calculus, um, Huygen immediately builds on his earlier results and explores the properties of the catenary, but he still uses the geometric means. I mean, he's not the one who's who's employing um, the new rules of calculus. And when Leibniz does it, uh, he conceives it as a problem, as a challenge for his new rules of calculus, his analytical method. And although he has a new tool in his hand, uh, the way he applies it first um, in the way that Huygens and Galileo had done, it doesn't lead him anywhere. And only eventually succeeds if he looks at the chain, not as a local mechanical equilibrium problem, but as a continuous line. That's the story that I'm, um, uh, uh, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a more complicated story. And then just the, the final point, and if we, another 50 years later in the 1740s, when Euler uh, writes his book on the variation of a calculus, uh, where as the editor of the Euler volume, of that Euler volume, Karadeo has shown, there are more than a hundred problems uh, sort of illustrated and calculated in, in, the, in, in this variation of calculus. The, um, the catenary is just one among those problems. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Tim, uh, you know, thanks from my heart. Uh, you, you must know what an intellectual pleasure it is for me personally to follow your talk because as you mentioned, it is a problem on which together with Peter Damero, you know, whom, whom we miss, and Simone, I, I worked, you know. Uh, Matthias is also, <laughs> was part of the crew who looked at these problems. And uh, I just found it wonderful to hear the sequel of a story from which I only knew the beginning. And you showed how it went on. And I think it is really a fascinating story. Because, and it connects to many of the general points that we discussed this morning, because what you, and, and let me just gloss uh, over just to make uh, this, this more popular among the general audience who may not be so familiar with these problems. So clearly the chain, the chain line was a practical issue. For Galileo, as you showed us, it had that role, a, a means to quickly draw uh, almost parabolic lines 
which was a matter of stability for you know uh, material beams. It was a matter for you know designing you know trajectories of uh, for ballistics. So it clearly had this thing, and it appeared to be within the realm of traditional geometrical methods. But what you showed us, and really precisely, was what uh, Galileo couldn't know, that this was really a problem at the threshold of the old and the new mathematics, if I may put it that, that way. It was a problem hardly tractable with the old methods. People couldn't know that, of course. But it really, and there must have been a strong interaction between this kind of problems and the development of the new math methods, uh, of the analytical uh, uh, methods of the uh, calculus and, and, and so on. And it, it is really in the nature of this problem to form kind of a bridge between you know, the physics problem, the, the practical problems of the time and the new method. So it's both uh, showing the intractability of the real problems and uh, their bridge function, because why did people, why were they, they so concerned with it? Because Galileo brought it up, it had a practical context. And Hanoch, it has a lot to do with your issue of the analytical and the synthetical, of course. Because, you know, the last, I love the last line of your slide there, because, you know, what was an almost, you know, intractable problem for people like Galileo and Heuchel became a standard exercise for students you know, only a short time uh, later because of the new method. So I think it's really a problem that, you know, symbolizes this important threshold in the history of mathematics and physics. So thank you for that. Sorry for this longer clause. Thank you. Do you want to comment? Okay. Yeah, thank you for this very interesting story. Let me expand a little on, on Jürgen's Remark. So I think we see an interesting development from an implicit geometric description towards an explicit analytical formula. Where did the, first of all, where did, the, where did an explicit analytical formula first appear? Probably in, 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 in Leibniz's work then. Uh, clearly uh, one, one finds it in, in Euler's work, but the method that then Leibniz applied was that the same did he, did he use the same techniques that he also used to solve the Brachistochron problem? And was he then conceiving of that already as a general method to, to, to solve variational problems? Or did that general insight only come with Euler? Um, so I'm only in the process of understanding these manuscripts of Leibniz. Um, I see that uh, he's, he's using his calculus in, in the sort of problem that the Galileo Huygens approach that he doesn't uh, succeed. There is this other approach that we know later from Johann Bernoulli, who gives them explicitly in, uh, in lectures on integral theory and explains how the, the differential equation of the, of the catenary is the, the, the tangent is proportional to one over the length of the chain. That's basically, it's a very simple differential equation. But the problem is that, length, that there's the length of the chain is what, the, what determines the, 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 the tangent. Uh, and so you have to kind of, in order to solve that, you have to re resolve the, the length of the chain. And, and there, the manuscripts indicate that um, uh, Leibniz at some point kind of goes, goes away from this, um, from this discrete mass problem and looks at, looks at um, uh, you know, continuous, continuous lines in order to uh, then apply his rules of integral calculus to rectify that, that chain. So that's, that's, that's how I see it. Um, um, but he, you know, he's never, you know, even though he's published three papers on the catenary, you know, in Latin, in French, in Italian, so everybody knows he solved the problem. He never tells how he did it. And you know, he, don't, he doesn't even tell you why it solves the problem. He just gives a solution. Um, uh, so, so uh, we only know from Bernoulli uh, how, how Bernoulli did it after the fact, and we see in the manuscript that Leibniz apparently did it very much along those lines as Bernoulli did after he failed uh, with, with the Huygens problem. Okay, Is, uh, any other questions? Well, in that case, we should proceed to the lunch break. Do you want to start at 2 or 2.10 or what do you want to start at?
two. Okay, so we're starting at two o'clock, so we maintain the original schedule. You have an hour and 20 minutes to have a lunch. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. So, so maybe those of you who don't have the lunch ticket, they can ask Lina, okay? To get something like, uh, like they want. You should get something like this. Lina, Lina, you should ask.